Welcome to EC. I guess I, I get the honor of welcoming you to the conference, more or less. Um, and welcome to this tutorial on information, persuasion, and decision making. Uh, so my name is Bo, um, and Haifeng is here. Um, and yeah, so we put this uh, tutorial together. Uh, we'll be taking turns, so uh, I'll tell you the schedule in a second. But first, let me just motivate uh, the general question that we want to tell you about. Yeah, so uh, in the modern world, especially uh, the internet-enabled world, a lot of economic activity and a lot of strategic behavior uh, involves a flow of information, right? And the value of information itself um, to people, not just exchanging of, say, goods and, uh, and items or something. Okay, and you can think of tons and tons of examples. Okay, but uh, a lot of traditional research and approaches to game theory or to economics are tend to be focused on cases where we think of the information as fixed and we don't really worry about exchange of information or updating based on new information. Okay, so for example, a lot of mechanism design assumes that the information is sort of fixed and not dynamic. Uh, but of course, in reality, uh, information can be actively um, designed so you can choose what information to reveal to others, um, elicited from others, um, and transfer of information can add val economic value in and of itself, um, or value to strategic agents. Okay, so this raises some fundamental questions, and uh, what's really exciting to us is a lot of these have really not been explored uh, very much until recently, um, uh, especially, of course, in our community in computer science, but even in econ as well. Um, so uh, how to reason about the value of information? Um, asking questions like how does inf information influence strategic behavior? Um, how do we elicit valuable information from people who might be strategic about it? Um, and how do we design information structures or design uh, the ways in which we reveal information in order to accomplish our goals? Um, or as a mechanism designer, for example. Okay, so that's the motivation, the kinds of questions uh, that are exciting nowadays. Um, so let me tell you what we're going to cover. So we'll cover you know, some subset of that, uh, those motivating questions. Okay, so first, uh, we're just going to talk about basics of signals and decision making. Um, so some of this is probably going to be review for some of you, and that's okay. Um, but hopefully, uh, it will help you think about it um, deeply or maybe in ways that you haven't looked at it before. So how do we think about signals as carriers of information? And we'll be in a very probabilistic world, and we'll be thinking about signals as probabilistic pieces of information. Uh, single agent decision problems, so what are those and how does information affect them? Um, and then Bayesian games, um, and what, what are equilibria in Bayesian games, uh, what kind of solution concepts, and how does information affect those? Okay, and that's going to be the first part of the tutorial, uh, which you'll hear some from me and some from Haifeng. Uh, okay, and then we're going to talk in the second and third parts about some recent research um, that especially that each of us has been involved in. Um, that focuses on some applications of uh, information and decision making and some recent research in those areas. Um, so one is uh, the idea of information being, pieces of information being substitutes or complements and why that might be interesting or useful. Uh, and the other is this problem of persuasion. So how to convey information to others in order to persuade them about something or to do something uh, that you might want. And uh, in all cases, we'll try to highlight uh, some related research that we haven't been on um, and some open problems and directions. Of course, we can't be comprehensive about all research related to information and decision making, but we'll, you know, we'll do our best uh, to highlight connections and cite some, some works you might be interested in. Uh, okay, so the schedule. Um, so for the next hour or so, we'll talk about uh, these sort of basics of decision making under uncertainty. So. Uh, understanding decision problems, understanding signals. And this, again, might be the part that's a little bit review for some, but um, I hopefully you'll find interesting. I will take a little uh, brief break um, and then come back for almost an hour about substitutes and complements. Um, and I'll be speaking about that. Um, then we'll have this uh, half hour coffee break that we share with the rest of the conference. Uh, and then we'll come back for the last part, which will be about persuasion, uh, which Haifeng will tell you about. Um, and uh, this first part will be splitting, um, so I'll tell you the, what we'll cover in a second. 
Um, and we probably won't need this full hour and a half, but uh, if, in case we have lots of questions or wrong long little, we have some extra time baked in. So please definitely do stop us, ask questions, raise points of discussion, anything. Um, right, so the, the point of the tutorial is to learn and understand and have fun. So, um, you know, yeah, do all those things. Okay, so speaking of questions, any so far about structure, what we want to cover? Okay, great, okay, so in this part one, first we're gonna talk about uh, information and signals, basic properties of signals, and what, what are they? Um, and then this model of a single decision maker, and what is a decision problem? And this is an idea that's very old, um, more than 50, 60, 70 years old uh, in economics and statistics. Um, and then, uh, so I'll cover the first two, and then Haifeng will talk about Bayesian games. How do we define uh, games in which people act with incomplete information, kinds of equilibrium concepts, um, and some related, related issues. Okay, ready to get started? All right, let's do it. So models of information and signal. Oh, and we spread out these um, notation sheets, uh, so hopefully that's helpful to follow along. But uh, here's the first part. Okay, so this first section, is related to uh, the decision problems that we'll talk about later, uh, as well as signals. So we're always thinking of this decision maker as having a set of possible actions they can take. Okay, the set capital A, and they'll choose some action little a. Okay, and meanwhile, there's a set of possible states of the world, and nature's gonna pick one of those states. Okay, uh, and it'll end up being random from a probability distribution that nature chooses the state of the world. Okay, so nature will draw a little theta from the set uh, that's supposed to be a capital theta. Okay, and the decision maker's utility depends both on the action they chose and the state of the world. Right, so for example, I could choose to either walk or take a cab. Nature is going to choose to either be sunny or rainy or whatever. And my utility depends on those two things. So if I walk and it's sunny, maybe I'm very happy, but if I walk and it rains, I'm not so happy. Okay, so this utility function is taking a real number. It's a real number. Um, okay, and we're assuming the decision maker wants to maximize expected utility. Okay, now as far as signals go, uh, so we have an initial prior distribution on states of the world, and everything that we talk about today is going to be from this random perspective or this probabilistic perspective. Okay, so the agent knows this prior distribution on states of the world that nature is going to draw from. And they may also get more information in the form of a signal. Okay. So we're using capital sigma to denote a signal. So you can think of capital sigma as a random variable. Um, okay, so for example, maybe I look at the thermometer and that's a random variable, it's a real number. And the outcome is little sigma. So for example, you know, 70 or 80 or 90, whatever. Okay, and uh, we might abuse notation a little bit and use capital sigma to denote the set of possible realizations of the signal. Okay. I hope that won't be confusing. So for example, um, in the temperature example, the set of realizations could be all possible real numbers. Right? You could also have a binary signal right, that is either high or low, and the set would be containing those two elements. Okay, uh, so how does this signal relate to the state of the world? So there's some conditional distribution and we're using phi to denote that. So phi is of sigma theta is the probability that you see signals sigma given that the true state of the world is theta. Yeah, go ahead. Is phi something that the agent knows? Ah, so yeah, so we will assume that uh, this prior distribution, uh, joint distribution of sigma and theta, I think in everything we do we'll assume the agent knows phi. Okay, but they may or may not observe sigma, depending on the situation. So, so this is a well-informed agent has some kind of realistic model of the world. Yeah. Kind of yeah, and that's, that's why I was sort of thinking about this probabilistic or Bayesian perspective. Temp said, yeah, so we always tend to think of our agents in uh, these works as knowing the prior distributions on things, seeing realizations, and Bayesian updating to posteriors, and doing that correctly. Uh, some of that gets into, so in this question of Bayesian games, if someone else is sending me the signal, 
am I correctly informed about how they're doing that? And Haifeng's going to talk about sort of the assumptions we make about that in this Bayesian game. But now if we're thinking of this signal as something fixed, we'll just assume the agent knows the joint distribution. They know this uh, conditional distribution key. Okay, so, um, so yeah, for example, um, if we could continue the weather example, um, maybe uh, I know the joint distribution of condition on it's going to rain today, I know the distribution of temperatures that I'll observe, condition on it's going to be sunny, I know the distribution of temperatures, and now, of course, when I observe a particular signal, so for example, I look at my thermometer and I see 75, I update to a posterior belief about what that state of the world is, right, using Bayes' rule. And uh, this is some convenient notation, this P sub sigma. That's my posterior belief on the state of the world, conditioned on I observe sigma. Right, so conditioned on observing temperature 75, I have some belief, uh, the probability of rain versus the probability of sun has now updated because I observed that. All basic, going too slow, keep it going. Okay, okay great. So some basic properties of signals, and again, these are things that probably may know mathematically, but I hope the intuition will be helpful in solving uh, more complicated problems later. So, okay, so we had this agent that started with a prior belief in the probability simplex over states of the world. They observed sigma, distributed according to this way, and they updated using Bayes' rule. So how do we characterize the space of possible signals or understand uh, the relationship between the prior and the possible posteriors. Okay, so to do this, some basic facts about signals that are helpful. Um, so first of all, for any conditional distribution, any signal, uh, the expectation of the posterior is the prior. Okay. So this is a fun fact um, that uh, is maybe obvious, but I think interesting and easy to forget. So on average, your posterior belief equals your prior belief. Okay, for any signal you observe. Another way to say that is your current belief can be written as an expectation over signals of your future belief once you observe that signal. Okay, so this gives uh, some linear constraint on the posteriors, um, uh, possible posteriors if you have this prior. And then there's a sort of converse going the other way. If I have a set of possible posterior distributions, is there some signal that can induce me to take those posteriors, to have those posterior beliefs? Uh, and the answer is yes, if P is in their convex hull. So if I have a set of posterior beliefs and the prior is in their convex hull, um, remember that just means that it can be written as a convex combination. So this point is in the convex hull of these. This point is not. This is the convex hull. Uh, Right, so as long as it's in the convex hull, there is a signal that can induce those posterior beliefs. Okay. So uh, this gives us a way to understand the space of all possible signals. Um, okay, and you, when we post the slides, you can look at the algebraic proof, but it's obvious and not worth going through. But let's just look at a picture. Okay, so imagine uh, we're going through Ithaca and the possible states of the world are clear rain and snow. Maybe we need to decide you know, what mode of transportation to take. So this is a drawing of the probability simplex on those three outcomes. Uh, the point in the middle is the uniform distribution. This point is the distribution that puts probability one on rain and zero on the other two outcomes, right, and so on. Okay, so this is the space of all probability distributions uh, on those three outcomes. Okay, so one example signal is I could observe the true state of the world always. Okay, and of course when I do that, I'll update to a posterior belief which is exactly that that state of the world will happen. Right? So if I observe the rain, then I update to this posterior, which is one on rain. OK, so that's easy. Uh, here's a, a more interesting example, I think. So imagine I have these three posterior beliefs. This is the belief that's uniform between clear and rain. I know it's not going to snow, but I have 50-50 belief over clear and rain. This is uniform over clear and snow, and this is uniform over rain and snow. You could ask, for an agent with this prior belief, does there exist a signaling scheme so that when they observe signal one, they have this posterior. When they observe signal two, they have this posterior. 
and so on. Okay, and the second part of the fact says uh, this is possible because the prior lies in the convex hull. Uh, okay, and actually there's going to be a unique signaling scheme um, because uh, the, the first fact said that the average of these beliefs has to be the prior. Okay, so that linear constraint um, will give you exactly the signaling scheme that satisfies these posterior beliefs. Okay, so in general, signaling schemes have these nice uh, linear constraints. Um, is, that, is that clear? Yes. So if we move the up a little bit above the line, more constraints. Yeah, great question. So if we move P uh, a little bit higher, there would be no signaling scheme. There's kind of an easy way to see, it, to see that because if your prior belief is more than half that it's going to be clear of, more than 50% probability, how can I send you a signal so that you always end up believing less than 50% that it's going to be clear? But with every possible signal I send, you believe less. Yeah, that, that can't happen. So that's where this convex hull idea is coming in. Yeah. So. To make sure this question was clear, if these were the posteriors and the prior was up here, it would not be possible. Good. Okay, so here's an example where the, there's a set of four posterior beliefs. And now in this case, yes, there's a signaling scheme that will induce these different posterior beliefs. There's actually more than one now, right? Because uh, this, uh, I guess I should have said underdetermined probably. <coughs> Yeah, so the system is underdetermined because uh, there are multiple ways to put weights on these points so that their average is P. Um, right? And so, yeah, so there are multiple possible signaling schemes. For example, um, you could have a scheme just involving this posterior belief, this one, and this one, that uh, the agent never has this belief. There's no signal one. Or you could ignore that. Uh, I can't quite tell, but yeah. No, that's great. So what would the difference between the different signaling schemes be Yeah, so it's um so a signaling scheme will say uh, one way to put it is uh, given clear, right, what probability do you send signal one, signal two, signal three, signal four? Uh, given rain, what probability do you send each signal? So that's how you write down the signaling scheme. You write down all those numbers. Uh, that gives you, for example, some a priori probability that signal one will be sent, some a priori probability that signal two will be sent, three and four. Uh, and different signaling schemes will, these numbers will be different, those weightings will be different. So for example, uh, if I fix how much probability I'm sending signals three and four, well, okay, maybe I can't fix both of them. If I fix signal three, I can play with the different probabilities that I send these signals in such a way that the constraints I mentioned are still satisfied. Um, and so in general, you can write down some linear program that describes the constraints that this is a valid signaling scheme. And then you could do some optimization over it um, efficiently, which is one of the main points I want to make. Uh, no, so the prior distribution over uh, rain, clear, and snow is fixed. However, uh, the frequency with which I choose to send, say, signal one versus signal two versus signal three versus signal four, I could change. Those are the variables I get to play with if I'm designing the signal. And I could change those variables. So I can choose to send the different signals with different Yes, yeah, so th I'm claiming there is a, a fee uh, such that um, the posterior belief condition on observing signal one is this, condition on signal two is that, and so on, uh, when this is the prior. And I'm claiming not only does there exist a fee, but actually there's a space of them, and you can write a linear program that describes the feasible space. So that's the main takeaway I want to give. Um, another comment, so 
Imagine that you have a meteorologist, Marcia, and she gets to observe this signal, right? Like she has a whole bunch of data coming in. And then she wants to send a signal based on what she's observed. Okay, so she wants to send you some, some signal over the television about the weather. Um, but she doesn't know exactly what's going to happen. She only observes some signal. Okay, so then you could ask, what's the space of signaling schemes that's achievable for Marsha? Right. What, what can she do? So for example, imagine that um, these are the possible posterior beliefs that Marsha might have. Okay. And so she can't tell you more information than she has herself. Okay, so um, without writing down like the linear program that is Marsha's problem, I'm just going to claim that it exists and look a little bit of the geometry uh, of what it looks like. So you can almost think of this as Marsha's simplex that she has to work with. Right? She can't induce in her viewers beliefs outside of this space. Right? Um, be it similar to the question earlier, right, if Marsha only believes up to, ever believes up to like a 60% chance of clear, there's nothing she can say to people that will make them Bayesian update to a 70% chance of clear. Because they know that no matter what she saw, she doesn't believe more than 60%. So how is she going to convince me to believe more than 60 Okay, so this is her space of sort of achievable posterior beliefs that she can convince her viewers. So yes. So yes, so, so let's say phi, this blue phi, yeah. this is the signal that Marsha observes. And now she wants to design a signal phi prime, where conditioned on the sigma that she saw, she gets to decide the distribution over sigma prime that she will send to her viewers. Okay. okay. Um, so she basically can only work within the convex hull of her belief. Um, and you can easily characterize all the schemes with, again, this sort of linear program that has the same constraints as before. So, for example, she could induce these three posterior beliefs. Um, they have to average to the prior. That's a constraint. Um, they have to be in the convex hull. That's a constraint. Um, and they also have to satisfy um, this constraint that it's a valid conditional probability distribution. Right? So uh, phi prime has to be a valid distribution. So given a sigma. Um, the probabilities of all these sigma primes have to sum to one, and be not right? Uh, and that's this is one way to write those constraints. Yeah. And she also needs to, in some sense, be able to commit to phi prime. Yes. So the viewers have to believe, in order for them to Bayesian update correctly, they have to believe that she's using phi prime. So she has to tell them that she's using phi prime, phi prime and they have to really believe it. And uh, I'm going to be taking that for granted, and Haifeng's going to talk about Bayesian games. Um, yeah, so for now, I'm thinking of very naive, uh, credible. OK, so again, the main takeaway from this, so that, oh yeah, so because this problem doesn't look all that much different from the problem of what our signals look like in the first place, often in the literature, what you'll see is Let's just assume that the person sending the signal knows the true state of the world. Right? And then they're sending a signal. And you might ask, well, what if they don't? What if they only know something? Probably those results that you're seeing can extend to this case where the person only knows a signal themselves and has to design a signal. Okay, so that's why I'm claiming it's without much loss to assume that they just know the true state of the world and they design a signaling scheme. Because if they don't, well, there's, it's still the same kind of linear program to characterize the space of things they can do. It just concerns. Okay. So, okay. So that was it for signals. Uh, the next in the next part. Okay, that took a bit longer than expected. All right. Uh, so for the next part, we'll talk about decision problems. Okay. So we're add, adding some notation. So uh, this is just a convenient notation I got from the scoring rule literature. So the utility of A semicolon Q, where Q is a distribution, that's just going to be shorthand for your expected utility. Uh, when your action A, you take action A, 
and the state of the world is drawn from Q. So if you believe Q, this is your expected utility for taking action A. Okay, and what are you going to do? You're going to take the optimal action. We're going to always assume decision makers take the optimal action. Uh, and we're going to never worry about that being computationally difficult to find. Um, so that's something you could bring in uh, that would be interesting, but we're not going to worry about it. So they're going to take the action A that maximizes expected utility. And you can write G of Q for their utility that they'll get having believed Q and taking this uh, optimal action. And we'll see why it's convex. And we can write A star of Q to be that optimal action. Uh, um, yeah, so we, we definitely want to assume a finite set of states of the world uh, makes life much easier. Um, sometimes we will allow infinite action spaces. Uh, I don't think it makes life too much more difficult. Right. Right, so we want, we, we want the set of states to be finite so that we, it doesn't get messy. Uh, yeah. uh, good, okay. So in a decision problem, the agent has to choose an action based on their belief. We assume they're going to choose to maximize expected utility. And the utility that they get if they believe Q, we, we can write as G. So now the question is, similar to the previous question, which was how do we understand the space of possible signals or signaling schemes? How can we understand the space of possible decision problems in a way that's tractable? Okay, so here's a fact that lets us do that. First, for every decision problem, this G function is a convex function of beliefs. First fact, I'll, I'll give you the proof. And second, there's actually a converse. So for any convex function from the simplex to the real numbers, that's the expected utility function for some decision problem. So that would arise from some decision problem. So proof for part one is, well, for any fixed action A, this U of AQ is a linear function of Q of the belief, because it's a sum probability of state U of action comma state. Okay. Uh, we'll see a picture. And the maximum over linear functions is a convex function. You've probably seen that before. But if I have a bunch of linear functions, and at each point for each belief Q, I pick the action A that has the maximum, then I end up with the convex function. Okay. Whoa, sorry. <laughs> um, good. OK, uh, and then to go the other way, you kind of do the same thing. So you take some convex function, G. You take all these tangent hyperplanes. You just call each of those an action and write this as the expected utility function for taking that action. And that ends up giving you a decision problem. And I think you'll be able to picture this better in a second. I guess you already saw the picture. OK, but this is just some of the details. Okay. So let's just see how that works. Yeah. Second part, unless G is linear. An infinite action space. action space. Yeah, which is generally easier to deal with than infinite state space. Yeah, so, um, and actually I'll, I'll give examples with infinite action space. Yeah. Um, good. Okay, so here's an example where, let's say there are two actions. I can either walk to the conference or ride to the conference, in a, let's say in a taxi or something. And what I've tried to picture here is the best response function. So for some beliefs, let's just say I'd rather walk. For some beliefs, I'd rather write. Okay, now let's see how this could come about. So let me give you some example numbers. So what is this decision problem? Let's just say that if I ride, my utility is seven no matter what the weather. Right? So I'm in a taxi, I don't care. It's just this fixed seven. Okay, so if I uh, ride and it rains, I get seven. If I ride and it's clear. And so this, this plane is my expected utility as a function of my belief. Right? So if I have the belief of the uniform distribution, my expected utility is 7. Okay? What if I walk? 
let's say I just made up some numbers. My utility for walking when it's clear is 10. Walking when it's snow, I don't mind too much, it's eight. But if I walk and it rains, then I get really low utility. Now my expected utility as a function of belief is this plane. Right, so for the uniform distribution, it would be this point, which is like 10 thirds plus 8 thirds plus 2 thirds. Okay, so that's why I said it's a linear function of Q. For every fixed action, your expected utility is this linear function of Q. Okay, so now how is the decision maker going to make their decision? They're going to look at these two linear functions, and whatever their belief is, they're going to choose the one that's higher. Okay, so in this region, it's better to ride. In this region, it's better to walk. Okay, and this is their function G, this convex function G. Right. Um, good. Questions about that? Yeah. Okay, so an example um, of a decision problem is what's called a proper scoring rule. And I'll bring this up because first, I like them a lot, and second, uh, it'll come up a bit later. Um, so a decision problem where the action space is the entire simplex, so your action is to pick a point in the simplex, uh, is called a proper scoring rule. If the optimal action, given your belief Q, is to pick the point Q. Okay, so the interpretation of this decision problem is, I ask the agent to report to me a distribution, and then they get paid some amount based on the report and the actual event. So if they reported the uniform distribution and it's sunny, uh, they get paid something. If they reported uniform and it's clear, uh, <coughs> rainy, they get paid something, and so on. So this is supposed to elicit their truth belief. So the optimal action, if they believe uniform, is to report uniform, and so on. OK, so this is an example decision problem uh, that's used to elicit predictions. Uh, OK, so how do you do this? Uh, how do you do this um, truthfully? Well, if you take a con any convex function g, then at each point, there's going to be a tangent hyperplane, and that gives you the utility function. Um, and if this convex function g is strictly convex everywhere, then we get this previous observation that uh, for each belief, there's going to be a different optimal action, which is going to actually be to report that belief. Okay, I know that sounds very abstract, so just looking at a picture. So if we draw a strictly convex function above the simplex, then I'm claiming this gives rise to a proper scoring rule. So a decision problem where your best action is to report truth. Yeah, maybe. Hope well, that's not going too fast. So this is a concrete example that's very useful. So the score for a particular distribution when the state is theta is log A of theta. Okay, so this is a, an entire definition of a utility function. Right, it's well defined for each of the possible outcomes and for any uh, action, which is a distribution over the outcome. Okay, and your expected score, when you have a belief Q, is the sum over states, Q of state log A of state. Q is your belief of the probability, and log A is the score that you get or the utility you get. Okay, and you can show using, for example, non-negativity of the KL divergence, you can show that the optimal action is to report your true belief Q. And so this convex function G in this case is sum of Q log Q, um, which is the negative of entropy, actually. Okay, so just a more, uh, an example with a more continuous action space. But often this piecewise linear is um, interesting when we have a finite action set. Okay. So this leads to a revelation principle for agents that we want to mention. Uh, so for any decision problem, there's a corresponding proper scoring rule, I'm claiming, where the action space is the entire simplex now, that is utility equivalent in the sense that the expected utility in this proper scoring rule for any belief is the same as your expected utility for the original decision problem if you had that same belief. Okay, so it's a revelation principle in the sense that I've taken this problem, I've transformed it into one where you just report your belief, and you don't have to worry about taking the optimal action. You just report your belief. And you can see this in the proof, because the proof is to say, define the scoring rule 
to be when you reported Q and the state was theta. Well, I'm going to simulate the original decision problem on the optimal action. So if you believed Q, you would have taken the optimal action A star of Q. And I'm just going to give you whatever utility you would have gotten. Cool. Uh, okay. So, and being truthful is an optimal action here. It's always an optimal action. I'm not claiming it's uniquely optimal. Okay, okay good. So the last, uh, I guess I have two more pieces to talk about. This and Blackwell's ordering. Uh, and then high angle speed. Good. So how do, si how do signals affect decision making? Okay, so the agent began with the prior belief. If they didn't get any signals, they would have to just take the optimal action for that belief. Right, so if their prior is here, the optimal action for that belief is to walk, and they would walk. And sometimes, you know, they'd get rained on. Uh, but after receiving a signal, they update to a posterior belief, and now they're going to take the optimal action for that posterior, given this information that they have. Right? Okay? So how does that affect their utility? What's their utility look like? Okay, well, we can visualize it here. Right? If they got signal one, they'll choose to walk and they'll get this utility. Signal two, uh, sorry, ride. Signal two, they'll choose to walk and get this utility. Signal three, they'll choose to ride and get that utility. Their average utility uh, is this new blue dot, the average of those three. So by getting the signal, uh, they've improved their expected utility right, before they were getting that purple dot. Okay, is that clear? So the signals improve their expected utility. Uh, and this notation V for this utility function in this distribution, the value of this signal, is their expected utility for updating to a posterior based on the signal and then taking the optimal action. So the value of the signal in this case is this blue dot in the middle. Uh, OK. So this leads to a very classical fact. Um, I, don't, I don't know how old it is, but very old, that more information always increases your expected utility in a decision problem. Okay. So uh, this gap between the blue and purple always holds, or at least it's always at least 0. Uh, the proof is that this value, this expected utility for acting given the signal. OK, so it's the expectation of these three points, the average of these three points. By Jensen's inequality, so g is a convex function, so Jensen's inequality says that's larger than the convex function evaluated at the average of the points. Okay. The average of the points is the prior, and g of the prior is always less than the average g. OK, but g of the prior is just the utility you would have gotten if you didn't see the signal and you just acted. Okay. No questions? Sounds good. Piece of cake. Okay. So um, one more point I want to make, or a different revelation principle I want to make, uh, point out to you. So the previous one was a revelation principle for the agent who's acting, which said they can just report their true belief. This is going to be for the person sending the signal. Okay, and it's going to say, what we like are these signaling schemes that are first direct. Direct means that each signal just corresponds to rec recommending a unique action. Okay, so if there are two actions, like walk and ride, there are two signals. One is the walk signal, one's the ride signal. And we'll call it persuasive if it's actually optimal for the agent to comply with the action they're recommending. So when they see the signal walk, like when Marsha comes on the news and says, you should walk to work today, they do a Bayesian update and they say, OK, conditioned on Marsha saying walk, it's best for me to walk. Conditioned on her telling me to ride, it's best for me to ride. Okay, so that's a direct persuasive scheme. And the revelation principle for signalers says every signaling scheme uh, can be converted into a direct and persuasive signaling scheme. And it's going to be outcome equivalent in the sense that uh, you get the same distribution on actions and states. Okay. So nothing's really changed but, um, in terms of outcomes, but now the signaling scheme is just very direct and persuasive. Okay, so the proof is that 
I can take all the signals that ended up in the agent taking a certain action A, and I'll just merge those together. Anytime I get one of those signals as Marsha, I'll just send the signal do action A. Okay. So the agent's posterior belief conditioned on getting this signal, this merged signal, well, it's a convex combination of their beliefs that they would have gotten under all those other signals that were, got merged. Right? So the agent can think to themselves, you know, maybe the original signal was this, maybe it was that, maybe it was that. They all got merged together. But under all of those possible signals, I would have taken the action A. So it doesn't matter which one it was. I should still take action A. Okay, and you can see this um, more mathematically. So the action that maximizes my expected utility given uh, this merge signal. I can write as a convex combination of my expected utilities under those original signals. And the same action maximized all of them, so it maximizes their convex combination. Quick sketch. OK, so you repeat this for all the actions, and you end up with this di direct persuasive scheme. And so just a quick picture of what it looks like in this uh, old example Right, is we took this signaling scheme, there's only one signal under which the agent would walk, so that's the walk signal. There were two under which they would ride. We're going to merge them together. Okay. And uh, you actually know what posterior belief uh, they're going to get merged to, right? Because the prior has to be a convex combination of the two posterior beliefs under this new two signaling scheme. Right? So in this case, there's a unique way to do it. Um, okay, so now I just send the signal P ride, the agent updates to this posterior belief. You know, they're not sure which of these two signals you intended to send, but they don't care because they would have uh, ridden in either case. Okay. Okay, so last thing for me to talk about before uh, you get to hear from Haifeng. So uh, the Blackwell order is this um, old idea about ranking um, informativeness of signals. Okay, and I don't know that we're going to directly use it in either of um, our works that we're telling you about, but if I'm talking about information and decision making, then I have to tell you about Blackwell ordering. Um, it's like legally required. Um, so it's a very important idea, a very widespread idea. Um, okay, so it's, the idea is to compare the informativeness of two signals. Let's say sigma and sigma prime. Okay, so sigma is distributed in some way. Sigma prime is distributed some other way. And we can say that sigma prime is a garbling of sigma if I can simulate it given access to sigma. This is one way to define garbling. You may have seen the term. Meaning that, uh, so for example, sigma prime, the realization is distributed as some randomized function of uh, sigma. Okay, so for example, um, let's say sigma prime is temperature rounded to the nearest five, and sigma is temperature uh, to the exact digit. Well, sigma prime is definitely a garbling of sigma because I take the temperature, I apply the function round to the nearest five, okay? and it's kind of clear that sigma prime only contains less information in this case. Another garbling is take the original temperature, add, say, Gaussian noise to it. So in this case, sigma prime is noisier and contains less information than sigma in some sense. OK, good. So uh, yeah, uh, you can also uh, think of it when I was telling you about the constraints for Marsha's problem. Right? So Marsha observed some signal sigma, and then she was trying to emit some signal sigma prime. That was some garbling of the original sig sigma. So you have the same kinds of linear constraints um, that we talked about earlier. Okay, but it's not important to go through the math of what the constraints look like. <coughs> okay, so the key theorem of Blackwell says that sigma prime is a garbling of sigma if and only if, for all possible decision problems, the value of sigma, the expected utility for acting based on sigma, is higher than the expected utility for acting based on sigma prime. Okay. And so, black, so this garbling gives a partial order, which is often called the Blackwell order. 
right? So uh, sigma is more informative than sigma prime if sigma prime is a garbling. Okay, so it's an informativeness order. And it's some partial order. Lots of signals can't be compared. Yeah? Yes, yes, apologies. That should be phi prime. Good eye. Yeah, so uh, in general, sigma and sigma prime are, and the state of the world theta are all jointly distributed. Um, and this, this statement in gray is mostly true, that another way to say it's a garbling is that it's conditionally independent of the state given sigma. You have to be a little bit careful with saying that, and this is a more precise way to say it. But you can think of it as conditionally independent of the state of the world. Yeah, so it's all one joint distribution. OK, so a quick idea of the proof before I hand things over. Uh, so one direction is easy of the if and only if. OK, so the easy direction is suppose sigma prime is a garbling of sigma. Then my expected utility is going to be higher given sigma than sigma prime. Anyone like idea of a proof? One liner? Yeah. Like first you condition on sigma. Yeah, so that's, yeah, one way to prove it is um, the Jensen's inequality we used before. It's just a sort of more sophisticated version of that. With like iterated conditional expectation. Yeah, yeah. exactly, yeah. Uh, you can also try to make some argument that's sort of um, more hand wavy, but you can say, well, any action you could have taken given sigma prime, I could simulate that action given sigma. And so, in the worst case, I can always achieve this right-hand side, and maybe there's something I can do that's better on the left. So there are many ways to prove it, uh, that direction. Uh, yeah, I like I liked the Jensen's approach. OK, so I wrote down one way to do that. The other way is harder, and I'm, I'm not going to go through it all. But um, the idea is, if it's not a garbling, there's going to be some realization of sigma prime that's more informative in some sense, in some direction, than an average realization of sigma. Okay, I'll try to draw a picture for this. And so we can make a decision problem, even just a two action decision problem, that sort of rewards this knowledge, this bit of knowledge in some direction. And by rewarding that knowledge, we can make it more valuable to see sigma prime than sigma. So that implies that if it's not a garbling, then it's not the case that for all decision problems. OK, so here's, a, here's one picture. So if these are the possible posterior beliefs from sigma, and I know that sigma prime induces this posterior belief, as well as others that I haven't drawn, okay, then it's definitely not a garbling. This is an example where sigma prime is not a garbling because it's not in this convex hull. Um, now I can make a decision problem where it's preferable to have observed sigma prime. Uh, okay, and it'll look like this. So there's an action one and an action two. And I'm only taking action two when I observe some sigma prime realizations, but not action one. Uh, okay, so if you only had access to the blue signal, sigma, you would only ever take this boring action. But if you have access to the red signal, sometimes you're getting some extra utility. Okay, and that's it. That's, uh, so. OK, the actual proof is harder because you could still have cases that aren't garblings where this is in the convex hull um, if there's enough weight on it and not enough weight on these. So the actual proof is going to be harder, but it's not a big deal to go through it. OK, so I ran a bit over. Yeah, more final questions? Good. Yeah. Uh, so, so the reason it's not the case that it's a total order on signals, the reason 
is this says for all decision problems? And so it could be the case, given two signals, there's some problems where this is more valuable, some problems where this one's more valuable. So it's actually very rare to be the case that for every possible decision problem, this one is more valuable. Yep. Okay, great. Let's keep rolling. We'll probably, because uh, I was a little slow, we'll push the schedule back just a little bit, but no fine. Do you mind just passing over that oh, mic? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> So uh, Bo have talked about single, uh, single agent decision making. Next, I'm gonna, sorry. Uh, okay, good. So Bo have talked about single agent decision making. Next, I'm gonna talk, uh, uh, tell you a little bit about Bayesian games where there will be multiple agents. Since we're uh, a little bit over time, so this part is more like a review of a bunch of concepts, so I'm gonna, I can go kind of slightly uh, faster than I do. Uh, okay, good, so my favorite, uh, why there is no animation for this? Okay, so my favorite way of describing a Bayesian game is to kind of decompose it into two parts. The first is the, the basic game model, uh, the, the basic game part, and the second is the information structure of the game. So the notations here are kind of pretty much like the notations you have seen before, except that I tweaked, I, I tweaked them a little bit to kind of cast uh, multiple agents. So in particular, now there were n agents, <coughs> and we're gonna use i to index a typical agent, okay? And for every agent i, he has a set of uh, possible actions, ai, and we're gonna use a little ai to, to denote a typical action for agent i. So now, A gonna equal the partition product of all these uh, AIs, which, uh, which is the set of all the possible profiles of actions. Recall that an action profile contains one action for each agent, okay? And uh, there is still one state of nature theta with a prior distribution P, and now for agent I, his utility function depends on his own action AI, and the state of nature theta. And additionally, this n negative i, which by convention we use n negative i to denote the set of all agents' actions ex uh, except i's. Okay, that's kind of just some conventional notation in game theory. Uh, so, and then the information structure of the game basically kind of specifies how much each agent knows about the state of nature theta. Okay? So we're gonna use sigma i to denote the set of all the possible signals to this particular agent i, and then sigma gonna equal the Cartesian product of all these sigma i's, which uh, contains the set of all the possible signals, uh, all the possible signal profiles. So, so the only thing to be careful is this profile basically means a vector of signals, and uh, the i-th signal gonna be sent to agent i, okay? And we can use uh, u sigma theta to denote the probability of sending the signal profile sigma uh, conditional state theta. Good? Yes. Uh, so is phi the same for all the agents? Uh, phi is public knowledge, and everyone knows exactly the same phi. And why that's reasonable, and I'm going to justify in the particular uh, applications, but not this uh, particular general description here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So signal, uh, sigma here is a, is a signal prof, uh, is, a, is a vector of signal. And uh, the i signal is going to be sent to this agent i. Okay, so agent i only sees one, or one, uh, one entry in this vector, yeah. Good? Okay, so uh, in Bay, so somehow I lost the animations, but, so. Oh, this is PDF. Okay, good, never mind, yeah, it's, it, okay. So, uh, in a single agent decision making, we kind of we analyze the op player's optimal decision, but uh, in this in, Beijing, in in games, the 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 uh, the solution concept that we adopt is usually an equilibrium. So in Beijing games, there were two uh, there were two very natural equilibrium concepts. The first is the so-called base Nash equilibria. So in a Beijing game, a strategy for each player is basically a mapping beta i that maps the signal the agent sees. To, uh, to a distribution of actions. Basically, it tells he, uh, he cannot decide which, uh, with, with what probability to take which action, okay? 
And you can kind of mathematically specify this user variable beta ai sigma i, which is a probability of taking action ai uh, given signal sigma i. Okay? So the, a profile of strategies is, uh, forms a base Nash equilibria if unilateral deviation is not beneficial for any agent. So here's a kind of mathematical definition for this, which you don't need really to look at it for now. You can, when we post the slides, you can look at the math. But roughly, it's saying that for every agent i and the signal sigma i, if action ai has a positive probability, then its expected utility should be at least the expected utility of any other actions, ai prime, because uh, that's why you want to take this action. I. That's your best response. Okay? And that's kind of the definition, which is very similar to the standard Nash equilibrium defi definition without, uh, without uh, with, uh, in the uh, complete information case. Uh, so another natural uh, equilibrium concept is called a base correlated equilibria. So uh, here we're going to view every correlated equilibria as a kind of action recommendation rule that maps a realized state of nature theta and the signal profile to a di distribution over action profiles. The way to view this is you can, you can kind of look at it as a, a principle who kind of first observe the realized state theta and the profile of uh, signals and then sample an action profile and recommend each action to the corresponding, uh, to the corresponding agent. Uh, again, you can kind of mathematically specify this rule use a probability of, a, uh, of action profile A conditional theta and sigma. So now an action recommendation rule pi is called a base correlated equilibria. If the recommendation satisfies the following obedience constraints, again, you don't need to look at the math now, but roughly it's saying that whenever an action AI is recommended, it's, it's better your favorite action, so that you don't have any uh, incentive to deviate to another action. Okay? Uh, so that's kind of the definition. Uh, so here's a very simple fact. It's saying that any base Nash equilibria also correspond to a base correlated equilibria. Uh, there is a kind of another, uh, so in, this also holds in the complete information case. And the proof is basically just by definition, because in the Nash, in the Nash equilibria, you can view the actions player, taken, uh, player takes as just, uh, as, as, as just a recommendation from some principle. And the uh, obedience constraint basically follows naturally from the condition of Nash equilibria. Uh, so next, we want to kind of compare the informativeness of uh, information structures as both did in a single agent case. And uh, in particular, I also want to see how the informative, informativeness of information structures affected the equilibrium outcome of the game. So recall that uh, Bo just actually talked about. Uh, Blackwell order kind of compared the informativeness of signaling scheme. Uh, so in his definition, so he, he talked about several definitions, but one of the definitions is the follows. So sigma prime, T prime is a garbling of sigma phi if they can be coupled in a way such that a sigma prime is independent of theta given uh, conditional, conditional sigma. So now the following is a natural generalization of garbling to the case with a vector of, uh, uh, a vector of signals. So, so these two are going to have different names, I think, due to some historical reason. But roughly, so we're going to say that an information structure sigma phi is uh, individually sufficient for sigma prime phi prime if they can be coupled in a way such that uh, uh, for any i, sigma i prime is independent of theta and uh, sigma negative i conditional sigma i. The only difference from the Blackwell's definition for a single, uh, for a single signal is uh, this sigma i prime should be independent of this uh, sigma negative i. Okay? So now, if you only have one agent, then I don't have this sigma negative i. So this definition will degenerate to Blackwell's definition. Uh, so I don't know why they have different name. I think due to some historical reason. But really, they're, they're, they're uh, describing similar things. Uh, so uh, intuit intuitively, this is kind of saying that sigma i prime contains no more information than sigma i about theta, because if theta i if, if sigma, yeah, about uh, about theta if because if sigma i is given, then sigma i prime is independent of theta, meaning that it doesn't carry any information about theta. So sigma, in other words, sigma i is more informative than sigma i prime, 
and this holds for every i. Therefore, uh, in general, so intuitively saying that the sigma phi is more informative than sigma I, uh, phi i. Okay. Uh, so this theorem shows that uh, uh, this theorem illustrates that how uh, this informativeness affects the the base Nash equilibrium, uh, base correlated equilibrium. So it says that sigma phi is uh, individually sufficient for sigma prime phi prime if and only if the set of base correlated equilibria induced by sigma phi is a subset of the set of base correlated equilibria induced by sigma prime phi prime. And actually, I've got uh, some very important thing here. This holds for any Bayesian games. Okay, this matter reminds you Blackwell's uh, definition, where it's saying that. Uh, uh, this guy is uh, a gobbly of this guy if uh, uh, the utility is higher for uh, for for the sigma is uh, the the utility for sigma is higher than utility for sigma prime for any decision problem this is kind of a similar theorem and uh, so uh, this theorem says that uh, inform more information basically means a smaller set of base correlated equilibria because sigma is more informative than sigma prime so it's a subset of this uh, this guy. Uh, so uh, intuitively, this is because more information is going to give rise to more constraints. So make the set of base correlated equilibria smaller. Uh, to give you some intuitions, here is a kind of much simplified illustration. Recall that the base correlated equilibria uh, need to satisfy these co uh, obedience constraints like this. Uh, so let's consider two very simple information structures. The first is uh, the kind of four information. That is, whenever theta is realized, you just uh, tell the you just tell reveal theta to everyone. Okay, in that case, this obedience constraint have to hold for every state theta, uh, for every action ai. And now consider another information structure where you reveal no information. That is, uh, whenever whichever theta is realized, you can always send the same signal. Okay, in this case, you will you will only have one such constraint for every action ai. And it turns out that you can prove this constraint actually can be implied by those constraints uh, under, uh, under four information by kind of linearly combining those constraints. OK? So in other words, uh, the, the case with uh, no information is kind of less constrained. Therefore, has a kind of has a larger set of, uh, has a larger feasible region. And that's why the base uh, correlated equilibrium is large, uh, the set of base correlated equilibrium is large. Uh, so it turns out that this uh, ar argument can be generalized to compare any two uh, information structures as long as you have this individual sufficiency. So that kind of gives the intuition about the, uh, the theorem. So, uh, so this theorem also defines a partial order over information structures uh, about regarding the informativeness of the information structure. And as I mentioned before, if you only have one agent, this uh, order degenerates to the Blackwell's order. So in other words, this definition is kind of a strictly general generalization of Blackwell's order. Uh, so let's see how much time I have. Uh, next, I'm going to illustrate this uh, uh, equilibrium concepts and information structure with a very simple example here, uh, the prisoner's dilemma of incomplete information. So this is a classical prisoner's dilemma, and many of you may already I think most of you may have seen this. So now let's kind of slightly modify it a little bit by kind of add by adding an additional random reward theta to encourage cooperation. So for so basically for every uh, for the cooperate action, there's additional reward theta added to the payoff. And let's assume that theta is a uniform random draw from three numbers: zero, two, or four point one. Okay, so that's kind of the basic game. This kind of the, the this is the basic game, as I mentioned before. And now I'm gonna talk about the different information structures. The first one is the structure with the four information. That is, the player is gonna know theta exactly. Okay, in this case, when the when the theta is realized and the player is gonna observe theta, then the, then a game of complete information will be played. Right after player sees theta, then they're gonna play their strategy. And I claim that in this case, the, there's a unique base Nash equilibria, which also corresponds to the unique base correlated. Uh, and also, there's a unique base correlated equilibria correspond to the Nash equilibria. Uh, so here's the reason. So first, observe that for any state theta, 
there is a, a un, there is a kind of there is a strict dominant strategy for 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 each player. For example, if theta equals zero, this is kind of the classical prisoner dilemma, and the defect is a dominant strategy. And when theta equals two, you can verify that the defect is also a the defect is also a dominant strategy. And when theta equals four point one, uh, it turns out that this reward is large enough to reverse player's action, and the mech cooperate actually the dominant strategy. Because actually, I have designed the payoff that uh, whenever theta is greater than three, uh, uh, cooperate becomes a dom dominant strategy. Okay, so th therefore, so whenever the state theta is realized, there is a dominant strategy Nash equilibrium. So the so in general, so overall, the base Nash equilibrium is unique. So why the base correlated equilibrium is also unique? Well, because when theta is realized, player can observe theta exactly, and now the 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 a, a principle cannot recommend anything except the dominant strategy, because uh, any other recommendation will violate the obedience constraint. So you don't have any choice; just recommend the dominant strategy. That's why the base correlated equilibrium is also unique. In this case, uh, so okay, that's for this information structure. Next, I'm gonna consider an information structure with uh, some partial information. Uh, that is, uh, the player is gonna know whether theta equals zero or not. Okay, so that basically the after the realization of theta, this fee gonna tell both players that whether theta equals zero or not. Okay, now in this case, I claim that there is still a, uh, a unique base Nash equilibrium. Why? Well, if theta equals zero, uh, player know that if player know theta equals zero, then defect is a, a dominant strategy for both. And if player know that theta does not equal zero, what does that mean? Well, that means theta is either two or four point one, right? And the player are gonna regard, look at this as a expected uh, as a expected reward, which is three point zero five. And as as I mentioned before, this uh, reward is larger than three, and uh, it's gonna make cooperate the dominant strategy for both players. So so in in either in either uh, case, a uh, player will have a dominant strategy Nash equilibrium to play. Okay, good. So that's for base Nash equilibria, and and naturally this also corresponds to some base correlated equilibria. But actually, in this game, there were other there were also other base correlated equilibria. So here is one. Here is another one. So basically, when theta equals four point one, I'm gonna recommend a cooperate to both players, and when theta equals two or zero, I'm gonna recommend a defect to both players. And it's very easy to verify that this satisfies the obedience constraint because it's kind of like a truthful recommendation. And uh, uh, so this is also a base correlated equilibrium. And you can actually see that this base correlated equilibrium corresponds to the unique base correlated equilibrium under four information. Therefore, in under this information structure, the set of base correlated equilibrium actually is a strict superset of the base correlated equilibrium for the no, uh, four information case. Because uh, this 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 structure is less informative, so the set of uh, base correlated equilibrium is larger. This again uh, illustrated the theorem theorem I, I described before. And uh, so, as an exercise, you can look at another information structure which is even less informative. That is, players know nothing about theta except its prior distribution. So this is even less informative. And as a simple exercise, you can prove that. In this case, there is a still a unique base Nash equilibrium, but the set of base correlated equilibria is even larger than the previous one, because this is uh, even less informative. Uh, okay, good. So finally, I would like to end with uh, kind of a, a, a simple remark, uh, a, a very useful remark for Bayesian games. That is, in a, a Bayesian agent in equilibrium cannot be misinformed. That is, uh, the, it's saying that there's no lying or misinformation in Bayesian games. It's, the, it's, it's really just about a, an agent that can be more informed or less informed. Okay, he knows more or knows less. He cannot know something wrong. Uh, the, 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 the reason is that uh, most models assume that the player know everything. He know all the prior distributions. And, and the player's actions and the signals are indeed drawn from these prior distributions. So well, as some some of you raised, whether this assumption is reasonable or not, that's another question, and it will depends on the particular applications. And in the rest of the tutorial, we're gonna justify this in some particular applications, uh, specified to the particular applications. Okay. Uh,
So here's a, I guess here's a recap of uh, what we talked. I'm going to skip that due to time reason. And uh, that's it. That's it for the first part. So I guess we can come back in 10 minutes. Um, so yeah, uh, five or 10 minutes. All right, welcome back. Everyone is still awake? Still good to go? All right, awesome. Uh, so uh, this part, um, I'll be speaking for this part. We'll go hopefully somewhat less than 50 minutes uh, so that we can get to the coffee break. Um, and then uh, after that coffee break, we'll come back and Haifeng will speak about persuasion. OK, um, so this part is going to be about this idea of uh, when it, pieces of information are substitutes and complements. Uh, so let me motivate that and then uh, give you a bit of an outline. Uh, so background, just some background so I don't use these words without saying what they mean. So in general, substitutes tends to mean this idea of a set of things where the total is less valuable than the sum of the individual values. Um, or a little bit more accurately for this talk, um, each thing's value uh, decreases if I have some of the others. Right, so the more of the others I have, the less valuable this thing becomes to me. And complements uh, generally exhibit the opposite behavior. So as I get more of them, they all become more valuable. Right, each one on its own may not be that helpful or valuable to me. Um, OK, so um, people often use examples like bread and pasta, um, or maybe information that I get from Weather Channel A and Weather Channel B are like substitutes, um, because they're giving me roughly the same information, maybe. Um, and then for compliments, you can think of things like a left shoe and a right shoe, uh, if you like shoes. Um, or things like maybe there are two pieces of information that on their own won't really tell you much um, about like, whether it's going to rain, but if you combine those pieces of information, they become very helpful. So that's the idea of complements that we're hoping to capture. Um, so just briefly uh, for motivation, um, so we know that these notions are very helpful and useful for items, uh, for objects. Um, so in economics, um, you often you even have like, existence of equilibria in markets. Um, when items are substitutes and maybe non-existence in other cases. Um, so, and, and um, like in things like selling items, sometimes uh, substitutability can give you good approximations. Um, so like to revenue or welfare, things like that. Uh, so these seem like really useful uh, concepts. They're also useful in algorithms. So a lot of times um, efficient algorithms or greedy algorithms um, might work well in cases where there are substitutes. Um, in particular, complements seem harder to deal with. So to me, this motivates this question of, does this apply to information or not? And that's really my motivation. Um, kind of just starts there. The hope is also, OK, not just understanding how it applies, but how it could be useful as well. But um, the definitions and concepts I'll be telling you about are still more at the um, understanding stage than the useful stage so far. I'm hoping that by communicating them to all of you, you can um, find ways that they might be useful to you or um, applications for them. Or hopefully we, we all can. Um, OK, so we're going to cover definitions of what it means for pieces of information to be substitutes or complements. Um, and I'm basing this mostly on my uh, paper with Eiling Chen in 2016. And that was inspired by, had ideas from this uh, econ paper of 2013. Um, I'll tell you a little what exactly they do, but um, yeah, uh, our definitions are based on theirs. Then I'll talk about known applications and results. Our original motivation was actually for prediction markets, and I'll tell you what those, were, those are um, and what the applications are. Um, and I'll talk about some, some algorithmic problems that come up that are interesting. And then uh, what do we know about examples? So what are some signals that are substitutes? What are some actual signals that are complements? Um, and then some open problems. And again, please ask lots of questions. Uh, good, OK. So the outline is basically what I was just saying. So first we'll see the definitions, then applications, examples, and open problems. 
OK, so a quick reminder. Um, it's been a while now since uh, it's been at least 10 minutes. So um, we have a prior on states of the world. Um, and now we have these set, maybe multiple signals. So again, as Haifeng was saying, um, for now, let's not worry about, let's still think of a single agent. But maybe there are multiple signals. Maybe there are n of them. And there's this joint distribution on the signals and the state of the world. It's like condition on theta. This is the distribution of this vector. OK, and we had this decision problem. And for now, actually, for my entire talk, we're going to think of just a single decision problem, actually. Okay. So for me, A is still just a single action. Um, so it's not the, this vector of actions um, that we used in the Bayesian, general Bayesian game setup. For now, still think of A as the action of a single agent. OK, uh, good. OK, and I define this value function. So given a particular utility function and a particular distribution, the value of a signal uh, was the expected utility for acting based on that signal. For, so first I observe it, then I act. Uh, OK, and just to remember the math of how that, what this function is defined at, as this is it. It's the expectation over a realization of the signal of my utility for acting optimally, so taking the maximum uh, the action that maximizes expected utility conditioned on that signal. So expected utility over theta conditioned on signal. OK, and we had some shorthand that made this a little nicer. So g of p sub sigma. p sub sigma was my posterior belief conditioned on getting sigma. sigma. And g of that is my expected utility for acting out. OK, so that was the value of one signal. And you could compare that to the value of not having any signal. And I like to use this, uh, this sign, this bottom sign, to say I have no signal, I have no information. In that case, I just know the prior, and I would get g of the prior. OK, and you can apply its value function to any, any signals, right? So a subset of these sigma, or even some garbling of those sigmas. Right? And you could ask, what's my expected utility for acting given that information? OK, good. So, just visualizing the value of a signal, um, I think, is helpful. So here's the log scoring rule uh, when we're predicting a binary event. So let's just say rain or no rain. And this horizontal axis is, axis is the probability you believe that it will rain. OK? So uh, this is plotting the g function, the convex function g, for the log scoring rule, this decision problem. So if you believe 0.2, your optimal action is to report truthfully 0.2, and your expected utility is around here, okay, and so on. Oh, good. And this is actually the flip of the entropy function, binary entropy function. OK, so if your prior was like 0.48 or so, then your expected utility would be this point. But now let's say you get a binary signal. So you get a signal that's either high or low, like high chance of rain, low chance of rain. When you get the high signal, you update to this posterior belief. Then you'll predict, and you'll get, on average, you expect to get this score. You'll predict this number. If you get the low signal, similarly. Now your expected utility, your V of sigma, is the average of these two, which is this number. OK, so the black bar is the marginal value of sigma over having no information. OK, so it's the value of sigma minus the value of no information. OK, all clear? And again, Jensen's inequality says that this is always non-negative. Great. OK, so that's marginal value of a signal. And now I can define uh, weak substitutes. And I'll, I'll say why this is weak in a bit. OK, so let's say the set of signals are weak substitutes if this value function is what's called a submodular set function on, those, on, those set, on this set of signals. What is a submodular function? So if I take any sigma, signal, sigma i, and I look at subsets of the signals, and I ask, what's the marginal value of sigma i when I add it to s? Or if I add it to a larger set t? Okay? If they're, sub, they're substitutes if this is always diminishing, meaning that the value when I have less information, s, the marginal value is higher. When I have more information, t, the marginal value is lower. Okay. Yep. 
Uh, yes. So it depends both on the utility function and the distribution. Yeah, and so that's, that's why I like to keep these superscripts here, just to remind myself. It depends on both those things. Yeah, so for a different decision problem, under my definition here, this same set of signals may no longer be substitutes. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So again, this is capturing diminishing marginal utility in the sense that, so for example, if these signals are a bunch of weather observations, this one observation may be very valuable if I have none of them, if I don't know anything else. But as I start learning others, this one becomes much less valuable. Okay, so as my set goes from S up to T, this signal becomes less valuable. Okay, and submodularity is used for sets of items to capture substitutes uh, in the exact same way. So this is just really applying a definition of substitutes for items uh, to signals. Sigma space meaning? Uh, yes, yeah, so it's a submodular uh, on the power set of, on, the, this, on all subsets of sigma one to sigma n, yeah. Um, so if I think of it as a function that takes subsets of signals to the value for observing those subsets, it's a submodular function. Um, good, okay, so that's a definition. Uh, we can define them to be weak complements if it's a supermodular function, meaning the inequality is always reversed, meaning that if I have more information, the marginal value of sigma i is larger. Okay, and again, uh, as we mentioned, it's important that this de depends both on the information structure, so how are these things correlated, and the decision problem. And that's what I think makes uh, reasoning about information a bit more tricky than items or goods because these signals do have this underlying correlation, right, that really matters, right? Um, but it also depends how you're going to use them. The decision problem, the actions that you're going to take is what gives them value in the first place. And the interaction of these two things is sort of the important part. Okay, good. So we're going to talk about this for a while. So. Uh, initial examples, so sort of canonical substitutes. Uh, with probability one, all of these signals are the same. Right. So they're literally conveying the exact same information all the time. Okay, these will be substitutes for any decision problem because once you've observed one, you already know all the others. Uh, canonical complements, um, a little bit, maybe a little bit harder, but not too crazy. Uh, imagine that each signal is an IID uniform bit. Okay, and the state of the world is actually the XOR of all the bits, all these bits, meaning uh, the state of the world is one if there's an odd number of ones among the signals, and it's zero if there's an even number of ones. Okay, so why are these complements like all the time? The idea is if you know any subset of them, but you don't know the entire set, what's your belief about the state of the world? Uniform random. Yeah, it's still uniform random. I can know n minus one, any n minus one of these variables, and I still have a uniform random belief. I know none of them, I still have a uniform random belief. Okay, so they're complements in the sense that the marginal value of any signal is just zero, it's not valuable to me at all until I have n minus one others. And then it becomes very valuable because it totally determines what the state of the world is. Okay. Uh, and so you can actually show these will be complements for any decision problem. Um, good. Uh, intu so just trying to capture some intuition about what things are, might generally be substitutes and complements. I tend to think of things that are sort of conditionally independent, noisy observations of the state of the world, I tend to think of those as being substitutable, um, right? So each one is just giving you some observation of what the true state is, 
And as I combine more of them, I will get some more accurate observation, but you know, um, the marginal value of each maybe is going down um, because they're each just some observations. So the first observation maybe tells you a lot and the others tell you less, maybe. I tend to think of this as a causation going that the state of the world is sort of causing these observations. And I think of the observations as sort of relatively low sensitivity, like if I change one, my belief about the state of the world shouldn't change a ton. Just, just some intuition, you may or may not agree or uh, see it. Okay, uh, intuitively complements, I tend to think of if these uh, signals are ind independent components of some system and the outcome, the state of the world theta, uh, sort of depends on all of them. And if I change one, then the outcome could change a lot, sort of high sensitivity. I tend to think of those as being complements. And I tend to think of this causation as going the other way in that case. Because um, I really sort of need to know a lot of them in order for my, one of these to help me make sense of, of what's going to happen. Right, so individually, they won't tell me much, much about what's going to happen. But as I combine many of them, I can start figuring it out. OK, just some thoughts. Uh, OK, so I want to take an aside. Um, this is maybe just like an information theory geek uh, of me coming out, but uh, one thing I like about these definitions is you can think about them in ways that aren't sort of game theoretic and economic necessarily. Um, so one interpretation of them is you take this utility function, you define the value, and you define the signals to be substitutes if the marginal value is diminishing. Okay, that's the definition I just gave you. Okay, so now um, throw that out. Ignore the game, ignore the decision problem. Let's say someone gave you a distance function, a divergence d. Oh, and for example, think of the log scoring rule for now um, as a decision problem. It's a nice decision problem. Okay, for the distance, imagine someone gives you a distance function d, um, and it has to be a Bregman divergence, but you don't have to know exactly what that is. Um, I'll draw a picture. An example is KL divergence, and asks you, Okay, tell me about the average distance between your posterior belief and the prior that this signal gives you. Right? So, on average, how much did your belief literally change? Okay? Good. Okay, hold that idea in your mind for a minute. Also, imagine that someone gives you an entropy function and they ask you, how many bits of information did this signal give you about the state of the world? So what's the difference between the, I guess probably I should flip these, right, because this is larger. So what's the difference between the entropy of the state of the world before you saw the signal and the conditional entropy or the expected entropy after you saw the signal? How many bits of information did it give you about the uh, state of the world? Okay, the, the point, the fact is that there's a one-to-one-to-one -one -to -one correspondence between these three pictures. Okay? so. Uh, for every utility function, there's a divergence and an entropy function, a generalized entropy, um, such that the marginal value of a signal is the same as the expected change in your belief, is the same as the amount of information that the signal gives you about the state of the world. Uh, okay, and the classical examples are Shannon entropy, KL divergence, and the log scoring rule um, are all in correspondence. Yeah. It's the statement that if I want to change my utility, that there's a breaking divergence. Um, like so I, is this true for any utility function? Yeah. So the statement is for any utility function, u, there is a Bregman divergence d, such that this is always going to be equal to this for any signal. And then there's some, and that implies some generalization and, of entropy. Uh, yeah. And actually. My generalization of entropy is a little bit um, sneaky in that I'm just uh, taking the convex function g and I'm flipping it and I'm calling it a generalized entropy, but I have some reasons to think it satisfies things that entropy satisfies. Um, the divergence is the Bregman divergence of that convex function g, if you know what Bregman divergence is. And yeah, so here's a quick picture. So the picture I showed you before was. Uh, here, except for the, um, 
the marginal value, right, was this line. The, ex the value, um, the average value of having the signal minus the average value of the prior. This is the Bregman divergence picture. So the Bregman divergence between this point and this point uh, is this vertical line. Okay, that's the definition of Bregman divergence is take the tangent uh, at the second, go below the first and measure the height. Okay, so this is actually, this, since this is the um, Shannon entropy function flipped, this is the KL divergence. This height is KL divergence here to here. Okay, if I take the average KL divergence between the posteriors, that's gonna be the same as this black line in the middle. Okay, so that's illustrating my second point. Okay, so the marginal value is the same as the average KL divergence in this picture. If I flip it, then all of a sudden it's the entropy function. Right, and this is literally the number of bits of information that the signal has given me about the state of the world. So if you like, you can restate these definitions using those, um, and I think that's cool. So you can say that the set of signals are substitutes for a particular distance function, divergence function, if the average change in belief due to a signal is gonna be smaller the more of the other signals you have. Right, does that make sense? Okay. Uh, and similarly, these, they'll be substitutes if the amount of information as measured by some entropy is diminishing if I have more of the other signals. So I think that's a natural idea and it complements are the opposite. So uh, the more of the other signals I have, the more distance I actually expect my belief to change upon learning the next one if they're complements and so on. Okay, blah, blah, blah. So that's, that's the first set of definitions. Uh, now I wanna claim those definitions aren't quite enough for us to get a handle on strategic behavior with information. The problem of that, with that weak definition is that information is divisible. And so a person, so like Marsha, who gets to see all these signals, she doesn't just have to choose, do I reveal the signal or not? She can choose to partially reveal the signal. Okay, and the definitions I just gave you had this sort of very uh, discrete nature. They said like, um, if I add in the signal versus not, what's the marginal value of that signal? Okay, but the problem is strategic behavior could change a lot if the person is able to not just add in or not add in the signal, but also add in pieces of the signal. Um, so I like this quote by Benjamin Franklin. Um, and yeah, you can think of lots of examples. Okay, so does that objection make sense? This idea that, okay, the signals look like substitutes because every time I add one in or subtract it, there's this diminishing marginal value, but they may not actually behave like substitutes if a strategic agent has it and they only reveal a piece which is actually like complementary. Okay, so that's the concern, and so we formulate some definitions that uh, address that, which just strengthen that definition. Okay, so um, the definition we'll use, well, I guess we called these garblings before, or some randomized function. So if we start with a signal, and we have a function f um, that we apply to it, um, we can consider this as a new signal that you're revealing, which is uh, some post-processing or garbling of your original. So for example, I observe the temperature, but now I round it to the nearest five and reveal that. Um, or I add Gaussian noise and reveal the, rant, the noisy temperature. Uh, okay, so the definition for moderate substitutes is gonna look exactly the same, except that for all signals, we're going to think of any deterministic function f that I could apply and I want that the marginal value of f of my signal has to always be diminishing. Okay. And so this is trying to address my previous concern. Okay, the idea is there, there shouldn't be some deterministic signal I can apply that, may, that turns my signal into a complement with everyone else's, for example. It has to be the case that every post-processing is still substitutes 
has diminishing marginal value with all the other signals. Yes? Uh, yeah, but it's not as strong as strong substitutes. So, it, yeah, uh, there are three. There are three levels. Uh, yeah, um, I couldn't come up with a more creative version. Um, and I actually don't have in mind a particular application, so we'll actually use strong substitutes later. But it seems like there should be situations where it applies. So making the definition seems valuable. Okay, can I, anyone want to guess what is, what are strong, what's the strong version going to be? How do you strengthen? Random, yeah, randomized uh, F. So really for all garblings. Um, and yeah, so same basic idea, but uh, now even allowing randomized. So this is really capturing like all strategies a person could apply. They get their signal, they apply some strategy, and they reveal uh, the result of that application. Uh, OK, a uh, quick comment on the definitions before application. So I think the weak definition, I don't see any way to change that. Like, I, that makes sense to me as, as fixed. Um, the moderate and strong definitions are a little bit tailored to the prediction market application that we had in mind when we came up with them. And I want to mention that caveat, because if you're thinking of other settings where you might apply it, you might want to tweak them. I don't know. Um, still really, still early. So um, substitutes in general, this idea of substitutes is that the marginal value of something when added to something else is diminishing. Right? And in these definitions, the marginal value of a deterministic garbling when added to any subset of the other signals should be diminishing, or randomized garbling in any subset. And that seems useful, but you could imagine tweaking those, the fill in the blanks a little. So I just want to mention it. OK, any questions? OK, great. Um, I'll, I'll mention later the prior work, which had similar definitions to those. Um, OK, so. Um, I wanted to make this definition for this, uh, th this tutorial because it's a bit more general and maybe uh, relatable. So OK, it says marginal score game. Wait, don't look at it yet. So a high score game, uh, in my definition, is there's a game, we all play it, and whoever had the highest score wins, right? like an arcade game or something. right? That's what I picture. The idea of the marginal score game is that we're going to take turns playing, but whoever contributes to the most improvement in scores that's the person who's going to win. Or you'll, your total utility will be how much you improve the total score over the course of these games. So I'm calling that marginal score games. OK, and take my word for it that I find these interesting, and I'll tell you why in a minute. OK, so there's a fixed decision problem. So we're sort of gently moving towards multiple agents. Where, and I say gently because we're still just going to have one decision problem. Okay? But multiple agents are going to play this game. And the agents each have private signals or information about how best to play it. Okay? And so they're going to take turns proposing actions. Okay? So maybe there's T time steps, and you can play multiple times. Maybe there's some fixed ordering on the agents. So you play first, and then 10th, and then 20th, and so on, or whatever. Then finally, the true state of the world data is revealed, and we get to see how well each of your actions did. Right? We don't know for sure how well they did until theta is drawn by nature after everyone's played. Okay? And then your reward is going to be your improvement in marginal score. So if you came at time t and you proposed a t and the previous action was a t minus 1, then you had this improvement, or maybe you did worse, of this difference. Okay? And so you get some total net utility, which is the sum of all your marginal improvements, uh, which may be positive or negative. Okay, and in this game, we assume all the agents want to maximize their expected utility. They're all Bayesian. So it's really about information revelation. Right? It's really about if I play an action A1 here, what are people going to learn about what I know and use that to their advantage to play better later? Um, which may be fine, or maybe I don't want to allow them to do that. I don't want them to learn what I know. OK, so here's the main theorem uh, of our paper. 
So it's the case that the only Bayes Nash equilibria are to just always play optimally. So sort of your myopic best optimal strategy, don't worry about the future. Uh, that's the case, that's always the case if and only if these signals are strong substitutes for the decision problem. Okay? And the opposite thing is the case if they're complements. So the only, all right, we need this equilibrium concept called perfect Bayesian, but um, the only perfect Bayesian equilibrium are the opposite. So don't reveal anything, just copy the previous strategy. Like, just do whatever the previous person did, so you get a marginal change of zero, up until your last try. And then when it's too late and you, you know, this is your last chance, now you play optimally. Okay. And so what you're doing is you're avoiding revealing any information to anybody until your last possible moment. Okay. And that's guaranteed to be the case uh, if and only if these signals are strong complements. Okay. And so the idea of the only if here in these is that if they're not strong complements, then there'll be some ordering of the players where somebody isn't going to wait all the way to the end. They'll do something non-trivial earlier. Uh, if they're not strong substitutes, there'll be some ordering of the players where somebody does wait. They don't just play optimally, but they delay. So quick, quick idea of the proof. It's hopefully intuitive. Um, you know, there's some total amount of utility available. If we pooled all our information together, we'd, there'd be some amount of utility that we could get playing optimally. And eventually, actually in equilibrium, all that information will get revealed because everyone's going to play optimally in their last try. And that's going to reveal what they know under some, some mild assumption or some assumption. So a player can always, in equilibrium, they can always obtain a sort of marginal value of some garbling of their current information to what's been revealed so far. Right. Uh, in expectation, they'll obtain the marginal value of their information. Okay. The whole point of substitutes is if I wait till other people have revealed information, my information carries less value. If I go early, my information carries more marginal value. That was like the whole point of the definition. Uh, the whole point of complements was the exact opposite. Um, yeah. So if I wait until other people have revealed information, I can use that to play the game much, much better. And if I wait to reveal my information now. Uh, okay. Um, maybe a quick, quick comment. One thing that's a little strange about this is, uh, so I mentioned like perfect Bayesian equilibrium. So we saw Bayes-Nash equilibria. It's all about your beliefs and best responding to your beliefs. You have, when you have these dynamic games, you also have to worry about um, things like if someone were to deviate from their strategy at this point in the game, how would I respond? So that's called off the equilibrium path. Um, right? so, and perfect Bayesian equilibrium is a, a, a notion that strengthens requirements on those. Uh, but these proofs that we, uh, that we have, they don't really construct these equilibria. They just say they exist. Well, we know some existence result that says some equilibrium exists in this game. And then we can show with these properties that it has to be of this form where everybody is rushing or everybody's delaying. But we don't actually know how to construct all the beliefs that make this an equilibrium necessarily. Uh, but we're just really strongly using this principle that Haifeng mentioned, which is that if it's an equilibrium, Nobody's misinformed, sort of using that very strongly. OK, but that's all I wanted to say about the proof. Hope it's OK. OK, so why, why do I care about marginal score games? So really, I care about prediction markets. So in a prediction market, u is a proper scoring rule. So prediction markets, they're actually run in practice, although sometimes they're phrased like financial markets. But in theory, you have this proper scoring rule, and people are taking turns proposing predictions of the future. And you get to see other people's predictions and update, and you try to make the best possible prediction given all that information. Okay. Uh, and so there is a bit of work of, on trying to understand equilibria of prediction markets, and it seemed to be kind of hard. Um, and our paper didn't necessarily solve that, but 
it said where to look at least, so look for substitutes, look for complements if you want to understand when equilibria, so um, moving toward understanding prediction markets. Uh, there are also these machine learning contests that are based on prediction markets um, that I and others have worked on. Um, and there's some other work uh, that's been at EC that you can interpret um, as these marginal score games, and our results will also apply to that. Um, but uh, we were thinking of prediction markets. Maybe there are other applications still as well. Okay, so now I just want to talk about some algorithmic problems that come up um, that substitutes and complements seem relevant to. So that's no questions, and that's okay. Yeah. Am I assuming the private signals are? Uh, Bounded or unbounded. So I tend to think of the signals as coming from a finite set. Um, you may be thinking of the signals like a real number or something. Um, so when you say unbounded, do you mean like it's a real number that can be as? Um, so if you're thinking of the posterior belief, like approaching probability one or probability zero versus the signal, is, is that maybe what you mean? Yeah, so, so information cascades I'm a little bit familiar with. Uh, I think they're, they're definitely a bit relevant. Um, but here we, we have this really strong structure that the game is this marginal score like everyone is playing with the same utility function. And so from what I know of information cascades, I don't know how to relate it to this. But it would be great if these ideas were at all helpful in information cascades. Um, yeah, OK, that's all I uh, OK, so, so an algorithmic problem, uh, so there's a, a lot of work in computer science and stats and econ and operations research on questions that are generally of the form like information acquisition. Um, so this is one that we formalized in our paper and made this observation, but lots of people have proven this kind of thing without the lens of substitutes or complements. Um, so we're hoping that the lens of substitutes is somewhat helpful in um, recognizing connections between these different solutions. Okay, so the problem is you have a bunch of signals, and you have a decision problem. And it, the signals have some joint distribution, which you know. You're given. Um, but there are prices to acquire the signals. And you have a budget constraint, let's say. Okay, And you have to choose some subset to acquire that doesn't go over your budget. Okay, so this looks, I intentionally phrased this to look exactly like submodular maximization, if you've seen that before. If you haven't, it's fine. Um, and of course, since signals are uh, substitutes are corresponding to submodularity, we can just port over results from submodular maximization. So the fact is, for example, if the signals are substitutes, there's a polynomial time constant factor approximation algorithm for this. So it will give you, get you this 0.6 uh, factor of the optimal expected utility. It'll tell you which signals to select. Um, and in general, in achieving a better factor, is a hard problem. Um, if you don't have the substitutes assumption, it's a hard problem. Uh, and we can just prove this by redu reducing both to and from submodular maximization. OK, so uh, here, again, substitutes seems to correspond to uh, easier algorithmic problems, is maybe one of the main points. Or like using that assumption may, may buy you something. OK, so it's open to see more algorithmic connections, like more connections of substitutes to algorithms. You could extend this to like a dynamic problem, where um, first you get one signal, then you decide among a new set, and so on. Um, uh, yeah, so the, I mean, this information acquisition is a huge literature, but it'd be cool if there were some connections to be made. And I want to mention there's a paper tomorrow morning um, it doesn't use the definitions that I've given you, but it's using ideas of substitutes for um, one of these information acquisition problems. Um, 
And another open question is, if you, think, if you look more at econ literature and how they model signals, um, it often tends to be like uh, real numbers. So um, signal one and signal two are maybe positively correlated. And the higher they are, the higher your value for the item or something like that. Um, so a uh, question I'd like to pose is, um, is there a relationship between those kinds of models and these definitions? I suspect there is, but um, I haven't looked yet. Okay. Some more algorithmic problems. So some basic, a basic question is, given a decision problem in signals, uh, are they substitutes or complements or neither? Um, the reason, OK, this is tricky because uh, in it, you'd have to check an exponential number of subsets to check the conditions. And uh, actually, even representing this input is exponentially large. Right? So if there are n signals and each is either high or low, there are 2 to the n possible combinations. And the prior distribution is very large. So you need to assume some oracle and think about how you're representing your input. So just for the sake of time, I'll maybe skim over this. But you can, you can ask, how do I uh, solve this algorithmic problem of what signal to send? Okay, and you'll see problems in the third part of the tutorial that look a lot more like this algorithmic problem. Um, and maybe those techniques will be helpful. But the reason I care about it is it gives best responses in prediction markets. Uh, and, it, and there's a paper this year at ITCS um, that shows how to solve this uh, in a case where there are at least with two signals and the signals don't have too many realizations. So their algorithm is exponential in the number of realizations um, of the signal. But, uh, and so this implies an efficient test for identifying substitutes and complements if you have just a couple signals. Uh, which, for example, means in a prediction market you can compute the actual, like, if the equilibrium is everybody just make your predictions and myopically optimally and don't worry about the future. Uh, cool, so I'm excited about that. Okay, so the last part's gonna be very brief because um, we're running into your coffee break. Um, so I, I talked a lot about like substitutes and complements, but I haven't talked much about signals that we know are substitutes and complements. And it's kind of hard because it depends on both this information structure and the decision problem. And OK, I talked about algorithms for like given a particular pair check, but you'd like to do something general. And I think um, economists who have looked at this problem really want to do something very general, um, but it's tricky. So we don't know a lot. Uh, for this log scoring rule, which is this very special decision problem, we know, for example, that if the signals are all conditionally independent, conditioned on the state of the world, then they're substitutes. Um, and we also know that. The definitions of weak, moderate, and strong, they're all separations between these. So there are things that are weak substitutes but not moderate. There are things that are moderate but not strong. So we know some, some things. Um, we actually, this is like the one general result I know that for every decision problem where this G function satisfies this strange condition, which is that, that Bregman divergence function I told you about is a convex function. Um, then any time the signals are all independent, uh, they're complements. Okay. And this is kind of easy to prove with a Jensen's inequality once you make this convex assumption. But I don't have a lot of intuition for it. So uh, That's the kind of result you would, I think you would want, is to say there's a class of decision problems and this class of signals. And these, are, these combinations are substitutes or complements. OK, a natural question is, when are signals substitutes for every decision problem? Right, sort of thinking about how Blackwell said more informative for every decision problem. Uh, and that's what this econ paper looked at. So in, in our terminology, they define two signals to be substitutes if they're weak substitutes for every decision problem. And I, I, I like to call that universal weak substitutes. Um, so they have some results. but. This seems like really restrictive. To be substitutes for every possible decision problem or complements seems very, very restrictive. Um, so it may be a difficult notion to satisfy. And if you want moderate or strong substitutes and complements, then you can't get it for all decision problems at all. Um, OK, so pretty much done. So just some directions uh, that would be really cool to explore. Um, so I talked about prediction markets. 
going to financial markets would be nice, and this paper is really related, um, Econometrica. Um, maybe, uh, so everything I talked about was just a single decision problem, right? And in a Bayesian game, everyone has a different utility function, like in auctions, which makes life pretty hard. Um, that's where I want to move to, like general mechanism design. Maybe an intermediate step is common value auctions. And this is a particular paper where they talk about like, information being substitutes and complements, or substitutes at least. Okay, and then uh, there are these algorithmic problems like improving on this recent paper. Uh, okay, so that's it for, this, for part two. Thanks. Questions? Uh, yeah, question? You good? Okay. Okay, so, yeah, go ahead. If you want. I love questions. I mean, so a natural question is, is there empirical evidence that in prediction markets there are these equilibria? Ah, uh, yeah, great question. So um, uh, I don't, I'm not super convinced that this model is that helpful for understanding how prediction markets work in the real world. The reason is that in the real world there are many participants and they don't necessarily know that well the distribution of others. And so they're not really reasoning that finely. Um, but there definitely are these complements issues, like these issues of, so um, Haifang mentioned like, do you believe the Bayes-Nash equilibria is a good prediction? In the complement, in the substitutes case, I'd say yes, because everyone's just rushing to be, to reveal. In the complements case, the equilibrium prediction is everyone does nothing and wait, but maybe a real prediction is like bluffing, lying, misleading. So the fact that no one is misled, I think you do see that in real markets. And maybe you can argue it comes from compliments, but I'm a theory person, so. OK, cool. So let's uh, come back at 11. And uh, thanks. Uh, OK, so I guess we can start now. So. Uh, welcome to the third part of this tutorial. So in this part, I'm going to talk about uh, algorithmic persuasion. So uh, let me see. OK, good. So here's the outline for uh, this part. So first, I'm going to give you a, an introduction about persuasion. And then I'll talk about uh, uh, algorithmic techniques for solving persuasion and see how these uh, techniques also lead to new structural insights about the problem. And then I'll talk about applications of persuasion. And uh, finally, I will uh, illustrate how persuasion actually sits within a much bigger picture, which is called uh, information structure design. And I will highlight future directions and open problems there. OK? OK, so uh, now let's start with the introduction. So, uh, so w w what is persuasion? Well, so let, let's start with the example that many of you are familiar with. That's writing, writing recommendation letters. Uh, so this can be viewed as a game played between an ad academic advisor and a uh, uh, recruiter. Right? To be concrete, let's say uh, one third of these advisor students are excellent, and two thirds of them are kind of average. Okay? And a fresh graduate is drawn from this population. Therefore, yeah, a graduate student is going to be excellent with probability two thirds and be, aver uh, sorry, be excellent with probably one third and be average with probably two thirds. Okay? Uh, now, so the recruiter wants to hire a student. So he's going to get a utility slightly above one for hiring an excellent student, but he's going to get a utility negative one for hiring an average student. Okay? And uh, if, he, if he do not hire anyone, then he's going to get a utility zero. Zero for not hiring. And we're going to assume that the recruiter knows, a pro uh, so knows the uh, advisors, uh, uh, the population of this advisor student. So he knows that a student is going to be excellent with probability one third. So with this prior belief, he can figure out that the expected utility for hiring is going to, if you do some a little bit calculation, is going to be this term, which is one third with uh, this value and uh, two thirds with a negative one. And this turns out to be strictly less than zero. That is the, the utility for not hiring. Therefore, uh, a priori, the recruiter would prefer to not hire because uh, this, is, uh, this has higher utility, right? And uh, so on the other hand, 
the advisor gonna get the utility one if the student is higher than zero otherwise, regardless of the student status, excellent or not. Well, because uh, an ad ad advisor always want his student to be higher, right? And uh, unfortunately, in this case, the recruiter will not be willing to hire this uh, advisor student. Uh, however, the advisor has an information advantage. That is, he knows precisely whether each of his student is excellent or not. So the advisor is going to have students graduating every year, so he somehow needs to figure out an optimal way to kind of write a recommendation letter for his students. Okay? So, well, so what is the optimal way for the advisor to write a, uh, to write a recommendation letter? Uh, let's, let's try out some, uh, let's, let's try some scheme. Uh, the first, our first attempt is uh, the advisor can always just say excellent for every student. For every student, he write an rec uh, excellent recommendation letter. Uh, this is also equivalent to reveal new information because uh, uh, if you always say excellent, people gonna just, uh, you know, it's kind of, it's like just a reveal nothing. Everyone is excellent. So, uh, does this, would this strategy work? Yeah, good. So it turns out this actually doesn't work because if you always say excellent, then the recruiter will ignore your recommendation letter and just behave according to his prior belief. In this case, the student is excellent with probably one third and therefore will not be hired. So the advisor is going to get utility zero in, in expectation. So then our second attempt there is try to kind of honestly write the recommendation later. This is also equi equivalent to reveal for information. That is, uh, whenever the student is excellent, I'm gonna, the advisor is going to write an excellent recommendation later. And when the student is average, he's he going to write an average recommendation later. Now, uh, from the recruiter's perspective, if the recruiter receives an excellent letter, he knows that the student is excellent for sure, so he will be willing to hire the student. And this happens with probability one third. And on the other hand, if uh, the student has an average letter, then the recruiter also knows that the student is average student, and he, he, will not be able, he will not be willing to hire. And therefore, in this case, the expected utility for the advisor is one third. Right? Because uh, the student is excellent with probability one third. So a more interesting question is, can we do something even better than one third? And the answer turns out to be yes. The idea is to kind of noise, to, to, reveal, uh, to reveal a partial information about the student status. And it turns out that in this uh, case, the advisor can improve his utility to uh, two thirds, which kind of doubles his previous, uh, uh, his previous utility. Uh, so here's what he can do. Whenever the student is excellent, he will always, still always write, a uh, uh, write an excellent recommendation later. Now, if the student is average a student, uh, half of the time, he's going to still write an uh, excellent recommendation later. And otherwise, he will write an average later. OK? Now, from the recruiter's perspective, he's going to receive an excellent letter with the probability 2 thirds. But what does this letter mean? Well, it's not that the student is always excellent. But after, after some based updates, the recruiter will figure out that the conditional probability the student is excellent is actually half, because these two, because these two cases are kind of e equally likely. And it turns out that this, uh, this probability implies that the expected utility of hiring is this number, which turns out to be strictly greater than 0. That is the utility of not hiring. Therefore, after receiving an excellent letter, the recruiter will be willing to hire, though he knows that the student is not excellent for sure. OK? And uh, on the other hand, if he, if he receives an average letter, then he knows the student is average, and he will not be willing to hire. But uh, nevertheless, in this case, we improve the probability of hiring to 2 thirds. OK? So this example shows that uh, how an advisor can utilize information advantage to influence the recruiter's uh, decision making, therefore improve his own utility. Uh, this is exactly what mean, we mean by persuasion. That is, uh, the act of exploiting an information advantage in order to influence the decisions of others. In this example, the advisor um, uh, utilizes his information advantage to influence the decision of the recruiter. Uh, actually. Uh, persuasion is actually intrinsic in most uh, human activities. For example, advertising. Yeah, yes? So just a comment on this example. Yeah. I expected to find more likely, which is actually the advisor.
prizes are in a competitive game. <clears throat> and so the reputation for the accuracy of their re recommendations will also matter. Yeah, that's right. So I think uh, the I think you are imagining another model where there are multiple uh, multiple people sending the signals, and uh, that's a very good question. And there was some study about this, but currently I think the state uh, the state of the art about this is actually very limited. There's only a little bit work, and but in this uh, in in this whole tutorial, I will only focus on the case where on the market there's only one signal. Yeah, but it's a very good question to look at the multiple signal and the competition among them. Yes. Any other questions so far? Good. So uh, yeah. So as I said, persuasion is actually intrinsic in most of human activities, like advertising, for example, negotiation, and uh, politics, security, marketing, and so on. Actually, and uh, therefore, unsurprisingly, this has been the theme of a large body of recent work. Uh, I think the importance of persuasion can be summarized by the following title of a paper, which appeared at the American Economic Review. Uh, it says that one quarter of GDP is persuasion. So you can see like how much this plays a role in our economic activity. Uh, so in a large body of work devoted to persuasion, the most uh, fundamental model is perhaps this Bayesian persuasion model proposed by Kamenica and Jensko. Uh, this has been the building block of many models and applications. So here there were two players. The first is a persuader, who will also be called a sender. And the second is a decision maker, who is also called a receiver. So in the previous example, the advisor is the sender, who can send a recommendation letter, and the receiver is uh, uh, the re the recruiter is the receiver, right? And the receiver must choose an action from one to n. For example, the recruiter must choose an action about must decide between hiring or not hiring. So two actions for the receiver. And every action i has a random type theta i, which captures the uncertainty in the out outcome of this action, and it determines both the sender's and the receiver's utility. For example, the uh, recruiter's action of uh, hiring has two types. Either the student is excellent or the student is not excellent. And this can affect uh, both the recruiter's and uh, the uh, advisor's utility. Right? And the profile of this uh, action types forms uh, form the so-called state of nature, which uh, it's like the, it's a random state, as we can, as you see through the, this t uh, tutorial. And we can assume that the state of nature is drawn from a common prior. In other words, everyone gonna know the everyone know the same prior distribution about uh, about uh, about theta. And again, there were other work which consider uh, that players may hold a different uh, belief. But that's not uh, that's not uh, the, the 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 focus of this tutorial. And the model assumes that the sender can observe the realized state of nature theta, uh, but the receiver only knows its prior distribution. Therefore, the sender has uh, has an information advantage because he knows more, right? In the previous example, the advisor knows precisely that whether each of his student is excellent or not. But uh, the recruiter only knows uh, the, prior, the, the prior distribution. So in a persuasion problem, the sender must design and commit to a so-called signaling scheme, which is basically a randomized map from states of nature to signals. For example, uh, the, uh, the advisor must uh, decide whether to send a, a strong recommendation based on whether the student is excellent or not. And this process can be randomized, because when a student is a uh, is kind of average student, then the advisor still sometimes write a strong letter and sometimes not. So it's kind of a randomized process. Uh, naturally, the sender would like to do so in optimal fashion. So this is actually an optimization problem by nature. And so after a state theta is realized, then the sender must communicate a signal sigma drawn from, the red, uh, drawn from uh, x theta to the receiver before the receiver takes an action. For example, uh, when a student, uh, after, the stu uh, after the student is about to graduate, which, uh, in, which, uh, where, in which time the, his data will also be revealed, then the advisor must have decided to send a strong letter or not before the recruiter takes action about hiring or not. So okay, so that's kind of the, that's kind of the model. Is everyone clear here? Good. Uh, so 
A very important assumption in this model is the sender's ability to commit to a signaling scheme. So this is also the reason that, uh, this is also why we assume everyone has the, uh, know the, knows the signaling scheme. So it's a kind of public knowledge. And it turns out that in this setting, there were kind of at least the two ways to justify this commitment assumption. Uh, the first is that commitment actually uh, emerges at equilibrium, right? So if the game is played repeatedly, and if both players try to uh, optimize their long-term uh, utility, then commitment is kind of roughly equivalent to uh, establishing some reputation or uh, credibility for the sender. And this is really beneficial for the sender. So the sender has some incentive to do this. So that's one justification of commitment in this setting. And the second justification is that in many applications, commitment is actually uh, necessary due to some uh, service agreement or uh, trusted authority. Right? For example, in, uh, in the auction, the principal must uh, commit to some rules of interactions, which include the way to reveal information to bidders. And uh, sometimes we may have to publish code about the scheme, or uh, maybe we have to undergo audits or statistical tests. So in these applications, commitment is, is like a natural outcome or is a, or is a requirement for the, for, the, for the problem. So that's kind of another justification for commi commitment, depending on the applications. So um, next, I'm going to, so a particular type of uh, signaling scheme I would like to highlight is this direct persuasive schemes, which uh, Bo actually have already mentioned in the first part. So basically, in my, also in the previous example, uh, if you recall, the scheme basically just uh, recommend an action based on the status of the nature. For example, a strong recommendation letter basically is a, uh, is, is a recommendation of hiring. And uh, 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 average recommendation letter is a recommendation of not hiring, right? So in this case, the scheme is called direct. That is the signals basically are just the action recommendations. And the recommendation has to be persuasive. That is, uh, if the, the after base updates, the recommended action is indeed the player's favorite action. So th this is a per uh, persuasive. Uh, the following facts show that uh, focusing on direct persuasive schemes is kind of without a loss of generality. Because there always exists an optimal signaling scheme that is direct and persuasive. This basically just follow a simple revelation principle type argument, and Bo has kind of showed uh, shown it in the first part. So uh, you might feel familiar about the kind of the uh, action recommendation language here because actually I, I mentioned if you were here in the first part, I actually mentioned the base correlated equilibria, which is also like recommending actions. Uh, actually, indeed, a direct persuasive scheme is just a base correlated equilibria of this game. It's just a special that here you only have one player. Uh, therefore, solving the Bayesian persuasion model is basically just to compute the base correlated equilibria that maximize the sender's uh, expected utility. Okay? Uh, any other? Yes. Yeah. That doesn't seem like it's, it's fitting the direct and persuasive rule at all. So I think in that case, if the receipt, so basically, uh, so I kind of uh, uh, I omitted some kind of minor part in this model is that uh, we assume the receiver going to break tie in favor of the sender. Uh, so if the receiver is indifferent, we're going to assume uh, that he will take the action preferred by the sender. and. Uh, I kind of tried to omit this to avoid confusion in the example, but, you, but you're right. You can always push that probability until the end that the receiver is indifferent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. If the objective is to maximize any utility, won't that often done in contribution with the commitment assumption? Like the commitment assumption may not actually need to maximize any utility, like if you keep changing the way you run your
Uh, sorry, I, could you repeat the question again? So, the previous slides said that that is a common for the function. Yeah, that's right. Every time the game is played, you would, uh, the, the receiver would, uh, sorry, the sender would exactly do a similar strategy in terms of uh, one third will get excellent, and then off to the third, you will get half. Yeah, that's right. Uh, is, that, is that also empirically proven to maximize entry literally, like the common for the function? Uh, yeah, so I think the model is assuming that the first the sender have to commit, and the condi uh, based on that, then the sender computes. So so under this condition, under the commitment assumption, what is the sender's optimal strategy? Uh, so I think you are thinking that what is overall in general if I don't have to commit, what's optimal? Strategy? That's that's another question. That's another question, and you need to kind of uh, depend on the setting again. You need to see that whether there were some other constraints and uh, and also another observation that usually if you have commitment it's actually beneficial for the sender because you kind of have the first mover ad ad advantage which uh, is uh, in general it's kind of beneficial for the sender yeah yes also, if you don't have commitment um, it's not necessarily clear how to model it yeah that's right game. yeah yeah that's uh, that's also another reason because you don't have commitment how can you assume that everyone uh, know the prior belief exactly? And right, I, I can modify it maybe next round, and you don't know how, how did I modify it, right? So yeah, th that's, that's why uh, kind of commitment also justify the assumption that everyone holds the same prior belief. Yeah. Uh, good so far? Yes. Uh, that's right. Yeah, so that's right. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, so I'm assuming the set of states of nature is finite, uh, but it's it's uh, it, it doesn't make your life much harder if you do continuous uh, states of nature. It's just kind of messy to describe and sometimes to to derive. But I think the results I talked about about the algorithmic uh, techniques for solving this uh, holds pretty much for the continuous version as well. Uh, yeah. Good. Uh, so let's see. Okay, good. So next, I'm going to give you a characterization about the optimal sender utility. Uh, so now observe that any receiver believe p. Uh, so in the problem, the, the, so the receiver is making some decision. So for whatever belief he has, he's going to take a best response. This then result in the expected sender utility, right? So therefore, I can view the sender's expected utility as a function of the receiver's belief, which is VP. I'm, I'm drawing some function here. This is VP. And now, if, if I think about this P as a prior belief of the receiver, like prior belief, for example, for the recruiter is uh, one third excellent and two thirds average. Now, as, Bo, as we mentioned in the first part, a signaling scheme is basically a convex decomposition of this prior belief. Right? For example, you can decompose this P into two posterior beliefs, P1 and P2, and which each, of which, uh, each of which, so if P1, if signal P1 is sent, then the uh, sender's utility is going to be this point. And if P2 is sent, the sender utility will be this, uh, will be this point. So that's kind of the utility for the two signals in this uh, signaling scheme. Therefore, the expected utility is going to be this point, right? So basically, what I'm showing you is that if I have a prior belief P, and I'm, I'm, using, a, I'm using a signaling scheme that uh, sends P, signal P1 or P2, then the expected utility is going to be this point. So now the question is, what is, what is my optimal signaling scheme? So how far can I push this point to, the, to, to kind of push the point above so that uh, how far can I push this point above? It turns out that the furthest that you can push is this point which is going to be a convex combination of these two points. And that corresponds correspond to another signaling scheme, which kind of decomposes P into a, po a, a, distribution, a posterior distribution here and another posterior point here. And this point lies exactly at the concave closure of this uh, function. Right? And I, I claim you cannot go further up, up because uh, that cannot be uh, written as an uh, expectation of some signaling scheme. 
And it turns out that this observation can be made formal. And uh, here's the theory, uh, here's the uh, propos uh, proposition due to Kamenica and Jensko. It's saying that for any prior p, the optimal center utility from persuasion is v hat p, where v hat is exactly the concave closure of v p. In other words, this concave closure are, gives you the uh, optimal uh, persuasion, optimal persuasion, ut uh, optimal utility for the sender uh, for each pr uh, pr prior belief. Okay. So okay, so this is a kind of a di uh, uh, descriptive uh, result for this uh, Bayesian persuasion. Next, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a prescriptive perspective about the problem. In particular, I'm going to talk about the algorithms for solving this Bayesian persuasion problem. Okay, and okay, so maybe the first question you have is why we should care about algorithms? Well, there are multiple reasons. First, it will enable automated application, right? If you have an algorithm, you can implement it and automatically uh, implement, uh, run it. And second, it turns out that this algorithmic study will also lead to new structural insights. This is actually uh, a point that I, will, I would like to mention during this part. Uh, I, I would like to emphasize during this part. And third, the algorithmic study will also help us to understand the possibility and the limitation of this model. Right? For example, is the model efficiently solvable or how well I can solve the model. And moreover, actually some settings are kind of combinatorial by nature and therefore kind of requires algorithmic techniques. Uh, here is a, the, here's another kind of variant of the previous example where you can see that combinatorics actually arise in this example. Here, the advisor has multiple students. So in particular, let's say advisor have two students and the recruiter wants to recruit one of them. Okay? Note that the action for the recruiter is not about whether to hire or not. It's about which student to hire. Okay? Now, let's say that each student's type is kind of independent, independent, uniform draw from three uh, types, L, S, or W. And uh, student type going to determine the student long-term and short-term academic achievement. OK? So this L basically stands for long-term. So an L-type student is going to have long-term achievement 2 and short-term achievement 0. This is some student who kind of have worked on some very difficult problem for a long time. Maybe they haven't made much progress so far. But uh, he has a great potential, and uh, he can make great contribution in the future. And S basically stands for a uh, short term. So a short term uh, type student can have a, a short term utility uh, achievement one, and long term achievement slightly above one, one plus epsilon. So this is some student who have working on some pro have made some progress on some problems so far, and uh, you know in the future he has some potential as well. And W basically stands for a weak student. So a weak student will have a long-term and a short-term achievement, both zero. OK? Uh, so these kind of three types of students. And these two students are kind of, uh, their type is drawn uniform randomly from these three uh, types. So let's say the recruiter's utility is kind of the long-term academic achievement. And the advisor utility is the short-term academic achievement. So the only, stu the only student who is beneficial for the advisor is this uh, short-term type, S-type student here. Uh, now, so what is the optimal, uh, optimal scheme for this problem? Again, let's kind of look at, look, go through some simple uh, tryouts. The first is, what if I reveal no information? That is, I don't reveal anything about the students. Then, because then the student is going to appear identical to the recruiter, because they are both uniform randomly draw from these three types. So the recruiter will recruit a student, ran, uniform, choose one uniform at random. And this student will, be, will have type S with probably one third. So the expected advisor utility is also one third. Right? It's clear. And well, our second attempt is uh, what about for information? I just truthfully tell the recruiter the types of my students. Well, in this case, the good case for the advisor must be the case that the L type doesn't show up. Because if L type show up, the, this, this guy is going to be higher than the utility for advisor is zero. And the S type must show up. So there are only three cases. That is SS, SW, or WS. And each case happens with probably 1 over 9. So in total, the expected utility is still 1 over 3. Right? And so 
The question is, are these two schemes optimal? Well, the answer is no. It turns out that the optimal signaling scheme needs to reveal partial information about the student type. and need to carefully correlate the student type. Uh, so in particular, here's what you can do. So whenever there's exactly one type S student, you cannot recommend him. Otherwise, you just uh, choose a student uniformly at random to recommend. OK? I claim this is, uh, this is persuasive. Why? Because uh, the long-term uh, achievement for S-type students is 1 plus epsilon, which is greater than a uniform mixture of the L and W-type student, which is uh, the uniform mixture of these two numbers is 1. So whenever an S-type student is recommended, it's going to be better than uh, another student who is a uniform mixture between these two. So the, uh, the recruiter will be willing to follow. And it turns out that in this case, an uh, S-type student will be hired whenever this uh, S-type student shows up. And uh, this happens with probability 5 over 9. So you can see this optimal scheme already exhibits, uh, exhibits some combinatorial structure. And uh, the optimal utility is 5 over 9. OK? And as a remark, I'm going to call this setting uh, IID prior for action, type, for action types, because the action here is a student. And then the student basically are IID, because they are IID draw from some uh, types. And I, I'm going to come back to these settings, uh, actually, in two or three slides. So now we're going to talk about uh, the algorithm for solving the optimal persuasion problem. So let me start with the, kind of the simplest case. That is, the prior distribution is explicitly given. That is, you kind of ex explicitly enumerated all the prior, uh, prior distributions. Uh, in this case, it turns out that the optimal persuasion scheme can be computed by a linear program like this. Uh, so what, what is this saying? Well, we're just trying to maximize the expected sender utility subject to that. The first constraint here is exactly the obedience constraint. Record that I'm basically. I uh, record that uh, the, the Bayesian persuasion problem is basically computed the base correlated equilibrium. So this is kind of the uh, obedience constraint. And the second is kind of the, this is kind of, uh, uh, the scheme itself is feasible. And my objective is to maximize the ex expected standard utility. So OK, good. So this shows that for this kind of simple input model, if my prior is explicit, I can solve the problem uh, efficiently because we know we can solve linear program uh, in polynomial time. So next, we're going to look at kind of slightly, uh, slightly difficult set, uh, more slightly more difficult setting, where the state of nature theta is kind of has IID prior, as I mentioned before. Uh, more formally, we assume that uh, because the state of nature is kind of high dimensional. We're going to assume that each type theta i is a IID draw is IID. Uh, supported on a discrete set of size n. Basically, for every action, there were m types to choose, and uh, these actions are IID. OK? So in this case, how many states of nature are there? It's kind of it's m to the n, right? Because for every type, you have m choices, and uh, there were n types. So the total number of uh, action profiles is m to the n. Therefore, the previous linear program will not be in polynomial time, because uh, uh, it's polynomial in the number of uh, states, which is m to the n. Uh, nevertheless, uh, we showed that in this IID model, the, uh, the optimal signaling scheme can still be implemented in time polynomial in the number of actions n and uh, uh, the number of types m. Uh, so this theorem is kind of uh, is built into two kind of uh, structural insights. The first uh, structural insight is that this persuasion problem actually is analog to single item auctions. Okay? In particular, you can view an action basically as a bidder in the auction. And the t action types basically are like a bidder types in single item auctions. And uh, recommending an action is basically like allocate uh, the item to, to, uh, to, uh, to the corresponding bidder. Uh, so, the signaling scheme is basically like a randomized allocation rule with the obedience constraints instead of uh, incentive compatibility constraint for auction uh, in, uh, in the auction setting. So that's kind of one insight, which is kind of the relation between persuasion and single item auctions. And the second structural insight is that 
we prove there always exists an optimal scheme that is, that is symmetric in the following sense. Uh, each action will be recommended with equal probability uh, 1 over n. So, so each action will be recommended with act, uh, probably 1 over n. And all the recommended action will look the same in the sense that uh, they're going to have the same posterior belief. And uh, all the unrecommended action will also look the same. So this is kind of some structure about the symmetric, uh, uh, symmetric scheme. And it turns out that uh, there always exists an optimal scheme that is uh, uh, symmetric. Uh, so these are two kind of structural insights. And uh, the, the proof basically just uh, based on these two uh, insights. Uh, basically, here is uh, how the proof proceeds. We basically, we can summarize a symmetric scheme via its re so-called reduced form. If you work in auction theory, uh, if you work on, uh, in auction theory, reduced form basically is some like probability uh, of uh, the recommended action for each type. But in auction, it's kind of the probability for uh, winning the item for, for each uh, bidder type. And uh, that, uh, so it was known that, so the persuasion problem can be viewed as a linear program over the borders polytope, which it basically contains the reduced form, and plus some obedience constraints, which will be linear in the reduced form. Uh, and there is previous result known that this uh, borders polytope contains all the reduced form uh, can be efficiently separated. So we can solve the uh, linear program in polynomial time. Um, so that's kind of the proof of this part. So the main, the main message I, would, I want to highlight is the kind of the proof is built, uh, built upon some economic insight, basically the structure about the optimal schemes. So OK, good. So this showed, so what, this showed that for the IID case, I can solve the problem efficiently. So the next natural question is, can I generalize this a little bit to the case with the independent by non-identical prior distributions? In particular, we know that the border theorem uh, can be generalized to the independent non-identical bidders. So you might hope that the same generalization would hold, but actually it turns out that this uh, connection ceases to hold. In particular, we proved that in the persuasion with the independent non-identical actions, uh, it's sharply hard to compute the optimal expected standard utility. Okay, so the connection to a single item auction ceases to hold here. So this uh, gives us a structural lesson. That is, uh, there is no border theorem like characterization about a reduced form for persuasion with uh, uh, independent actions. Uh, this, uh, this characterization is also actually called uh, something called a generalized border theorem in previous work. Um, so, okay, so why the problem becomes more difficult? Well, it turns out that this is because the obedience constraint is not like I intensive compatibility constraint. They cannot be expressed uh, using the standard uh, reduced form as in, ad auc uh, as in uh, auctions. Uh, this is not an issue for the IID case because of the symmetric characterization. And uh, that characterization uh, kind of gives the rise of the connection. But uh, without that symmetry, uh, this uh, uh, connection uh, ceases to hold. So, and uh, so the result basically implies that any adequate reduced form have to encode some sharpie hot problem. Therefore, uh, total theorem implies that it cannot exist unless the polynomial hi hierarchy collapses. Yes. In the example for the, uh, the type of Yeah, good question. So in the in the uh, advisor example, it's basically one student could be drawn from, uh, has a type L with probably one third, one third, one third. Another student probably is a one fourth, one fourth, two half, right? They are, they are independent, but the distribution are different. So it's independent, non identical, right? Uh, in my previous example, it's kind of, I'm saying that they are both uniform randomly drawn from uh, three types. But it could be one guy is drawn from uh, distribution one third, one third, one third. Another one probably is one fourth, one fourth half, right? That's kind of independent, not identical. Yeah, and it turns out for that case, it's sharply hard to solve. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, a good question. I'm, uh, approximation is exactly what I'm going to talk next. Yeah. 
So yeah, so this is kind of bad news. So we cannot solve the problem efficiently. Then the next natural question to ask is how well, how well I can approximately solve the problem. And it turns out that you have a pretty good approximation for this problem. Actually, even for a much, uh, much general input model. Uh, oh, sorry. Here's another remark uh, first. So, so this kind of, these two results show some connection and the difference between uh, persuasion and auction design. If you, if you are interested in this, there's actually another econ paper which also proves some, uh, builds, uh, uh, is established some connections and difference between uh, persuasion and mechanism design. You can get some new insights there as well. So now we're going to move to approximately solve the problem. It turns out that I actually uh, I can approximately solve the problem for a much broader input model, the black box prior. That is, uh, here the prior distribution is drawn from an arbitrary distribution. The types can be correlated, and they, they can even be continuous. I don't care. They, they can be continuous. And uh, I'm going to assume that uh, this prior is given to the algorithm as a black box, so I can sample from the prior distribution. Uh, this is much broader than the, uh, than the previous two models, and of course it also includes the independent and non-identical case. And it turns out that for this much broader input model, I can prove that an uh, epsilon optimal and epsilon persuasive scheme can be implemented in time polynomial uh, in, one, uh, in n and one of epsilon. This is also called a Foley polynomial, Foley polynomial time approximation scheme, or FPDAS. And the only thing, the only thing here that I'm kind of have a bi-criteria loss. I need to lose epsilon in both optimality and persuasiveness. And it turns out that this bi-criteria loss is inevitable due to information theoretical reasons. So I can prove that if uh, if you have uh, uh, if uh, I, I can prove that if uh, you have epsilon optimal, uh, it has to be epsilon. Per, uh, so you have to be epsilon persuasive. Yeah. Uh, so this kind of the basically this shows that this is basically the best we can do for this uh, black box input, and uh, it turns out that the algorithm for this theorem actually turns out to be simple, though its analysis is much uh, is much complicated than the algorithm appears. So here is the algorithm. The input to the problem is a state of nature theta uh, theta star draws from the prior distribution. So what I do is basically I'm gonna in addition to this theta star I'm gonna take additionally polynomial many samples from the black box. And I'm going to solve uh, the explicit LP as I described before on the empirical distribution. But I relax the, uh, the persuasive, the obedience constraint by epsilon as well. So this is, the, this is the previous LP. The only modification I made is that this is now the empirical distribution. And I'm relaxing the persuasiveness, the obedience constraint by epsilon. That's it. And then I just, uh, after solving the LP, I just the signal uh, this LP suggests for this particular input state of theta star. So that's the algorithm. And this turns out to be the best you can do. OK? So the message conveyed from this algorithm is that uh, uh, if you want to query the scheme locally, that is, if you only want to uh, know how to signal for a particular state of theta prime, uh, very little context is needed. That is, you don't need to sample many uh, other you don't need to sample many other states. You only need a polynomial in many samples in order to know the scheme for a particular state theta star. So that's kind of the structural lesson we learn from this algorithm. Uh, OK, good. So this kind of concludes the part about algorithm for Bayesian persuasion. Any other questions? Good. Uh, next, I'm going to talk about applications of persuasion. Uh, the first domain I would like to mention is the so-called security games. This is a kind of a kind of two-player game where a defender faces a strategic a adversary who wants to attack some uh, assets the defender wants to protect. Uh, the defender wants to protect some critical targets, then uh, the attacker want to, the adversary wants to attack attack it. And these types of game actually has uh, had a lot of applications, uh, especially in some AI uh, in, in, in artificial intelligence. For example, people use this game to model the scheduling of federal marshals to protect the flies or protect the uh, endangered animals and so on. So, the main, uh, so the, most of the previous work in security games is kind of try to optimize uh, the defender's allocation of the resources to protect uh, these uh, targets. The main, the, the main idea of persuasion is that it turns out we can, the defender can also utilize information as a resource. 
kind of use the information advantage to deceive the adversary and improve the defense. And this actually has not, uh, has not been explored much and, until very recently. Uh, so to, to illustrate this, here's a, I'm going to go through a concrete example with you, which is about using UAVs uh, for uh, conservation. So uh, clearly protecting endangered animals is kind of a very important problem facing our uh, society today. Uh, you might, so uh, it turns out that illegal poaching is a kind of major threat to endangered animals. Uh, recently, there has been a rapidly growing trend in, in using UAVs to combat poaching. Uh, actually, there was some non-profit program which focused particularly on flying UAVs for conservation. Uh, for example, Air Shepherd is kind of one of them. Uh, there has been, actually my colleagues has uh, collaborating with Air Shopper to use uh, uh, vision techniques to automatically detect poachers. For example, this picture shows some detection about poachers. So the next question they face is, what should I do after spotting the poacher, right? Because the UAV cannot come down and directly interdict the poaching or directly catch the poacher. Uh, so the hope is that the UAV can notify some rangers who are close by to come to catch the poacher. But unfortunately, actually poaching usually happens during night, and there are usually very few rangers available in the nearby. Therefore, in many cases, even though the UAV detects the poacher, there is no uh, rangers who will be available to come to catch the poacher. So what can we do? Next, I'm going to show you how we can exploit the information advantage to deter the poacher, even sometimes when the ranger doesn't come. So, to be concrete, let's consider the moment where the air shopper detects some poacher who is looking to kill some animals. This is actually a UAV flying at night. Now this can be viewed as a game played between the poacher and the uh, air shopper and the poacher. Now the, the crucial observation here is that there is an information asymmetry between air shopper and the poacher. In particular, the poacher only knows that at this point the ranger may come and may or may not come and it, it comes with some probability that he knows. Uh, because he learned from his past experience. But Air Shopper knows precisely that whether a ranger is nearby and can, can come to catch the poacher. So Air Shopper has an information advantage over the poachers. It turns out that the Air Shopper can utilize this information advantage to strategically send an alerting signal to kind of deter the poaching. For example, you can kind of make some noise or a flashing light at the sky like this. And you want this, you want this alerting signal to kind of strategically correlate with the presence of the rangers. So it's not necessary that uh, you, can only, you, you will only alert when the, uh, so you can send the alert when the ranger comes, but you can also send the alert even when the ranger does not come. And you want to kind of sp specifically design the probability so that the alerting is kind of, uh, has enough power to deter the poaching. And uh, this, uh, so this is kind of what, this is how you can apply persuasion in the, in the model. And, uh, but, uh, this, but to apply this in the real world, there were additional challenges. In particular, this UAV's alerting functionality where it depends on the ranger, right? Because the only ranger can interdict the poaching. And UAV, though they can send an alerting signal, but this alerting gonna depends on the ranger. For example, if no ranger will be able to come, the alerting will also become useless. This kind of raises additional domain ch challenges due to particular domain features. Uh, in particular, we now need to coordinate the locations of the ranger of the UAVs. So we can imagine that there is some graph that captures the geo geographic structure of the area. And the, your, uh, the challenge is that you want to allocate the rangers and the UAVs to the nodes of the graph. And uh, the main difficulty here is that you want to correlate their locations so that whenever the UAV detects some poaching, there is a high chance that a ranger is close by. And additionally, you also want to design a deceptive alerting scheme using the persuasion idea I described before. So this, uh, and you want to do both simultaneously in a global optimal fashion. Uh, this kind of gives rise to the uh, new uh, model that integrates the patrollers interdiction functionality and the UAV's deceptive alerting functionality. And then you can take some algorithmic study about how to compute the optimal strategy and uh, whether you have efficient algorithm and things like this. So that's kind of just a one particular one example about how you can use persuasion in security domains. And, and uh, actually, there were many more applications about this. For, oh, sorry. 
here's some evaluation about the approach, which I'm going to skip, actually. Uh, but I would like to mention there were some other applications uh, in this domain as well. For example, you can prevent fair evasion in some owner-based metro system uh, by sending some alerting signals as well. And also, you can prevent illegal, par illegal parking uh, using persuasion idea as well. And, some uh, and there were also study about you can apply persuasion in cybersecurity. And uh, there are also new security game models that integrates persuasion. Uh, but I'm not going to mention the details here. Yes? So in these settings, maybe it's the first one, the persuasion setting. Persuasion setting is that we you, the, the receiver do not know the exact problem, problem distribution of the, uh, the traditional problem distribution of the signals. So instead, they have to learn this traditional problem distribution. So would that function? Uh, so basically, in Bayesian, uh, in Bayesian persuasion model, it's assumed that the receiver knows the prior, distribu uh, the prior distribution and the posterior distribution exactly. Yeah, but we, you, you do not know the posterior. Oh, you mean in this particular application? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's kind of a modeling challenge. But in this particular, do in this security game domain, it's actually, um, uh, the receiver actually can learn the posterior belief very quickly because the belief is basically just a single number. That is, uh, what is the probability a ranger comes? Right? It's just a one number. And also, actually in this uh, uh, poacher domain, uh, as far as I know, there is actually a community of poachers. They kind of share information with each other. So they can learn these things very quickly. And they're actually very strategic. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why this is kind of uh, a reasonable model for this uh, domain. Yeah. But I, but I agree, in, in different domains, you need to be careful about uh, whether uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's r realistic to assume they know the posterior. Yeah. Good question, yeah. Uh, any other questions? OK, uh, good. So next, I'm going to talk about uh, another application, auctions, which I guess you have to mention at EC. Uh, so uh, particularly, uh, I think uh, this is kind of particularly interesting ad auctions, because uh, which, are, which are auctions for selling uh, online ad slots. Because uh, in ad auctions, there is uh, plenty of uncertainty and information asymmetry between uh, the auctioneer and the bidders. So for example, this is an ad slot. From the advertiser's perspective, this ad slot basically corresponds to some web user who is browsing this uh, website. And this web user may be drawn from a huge, from a huge internet. And the adver advertiser really do not have much information about this web user. But from the auctioneer's perspective, he may know precisely who is web user. For example, some guy like this. So the auctioneer has much more information about the advertiser. Therefore, you could imagine that the auctioneer can kind of strategically reveal information to bidders in order to influence the bidder's behavior. And uh, for example, uh, for exam uh, they, can also they can actually send, reveal different information to different bidders. Uh, for example, in ad auctions, bidders are allowed to, sum to kind of specify keywords. This is kind of a, a, a shot of this uh, Google AdWords about keywords. And actually, this keyword is essentially to kind of reveal information about the uh, web user, because it's kind of telling the uh, bidder that uh, the, some information about this web user. From, related to these keywords. So that's kind of just the equivalent to reveal information to bidders. Uh, so the main difficulty in this domain is that it's kind of the equilibrium behavior is very intricate. In particular, the player's action are actually affected by the information they have, and also by the other bidder's action, and actually also by, by the information the other bidder have. So it's affected by many uh, factors. And another challenge is that in this domain, there were usually multiple equilibria. So there is an issue of equilibrium selection. For example, which, so w which equilibrium is natural to adopt? Uh, and I'm going to illustrate it via example that uh, uh, this is going to be an issue in, in some settings. Uh, so uh, he here I would like to kind of describe two very natural type classes of signaling schemes. The first is called a public scheme. That is, you must send the same signal to everyone. Uh, this is also, uh, this kind of, in other words, you kind of just send the signal publicly to everyone. These are equivalent. And this may be due to some constraints, for example, like fairness constraints. Maybe uh, you have to be fair to everyone, so you have to send the same signal to everyone. Or maybe due to some communication constraints. For example, uh, in, kinda in voting, 
So maybe some, the politician may want to persuade the voters. And you could imagine that uh, in our real world, it's not realistic for a, per, uh, for a uh, politician to persuade a voter uh, individually. So usually the way is to give some public speech, right? So that's kind of public persuasion. And uh, in contrast to this public scheme is a private scheme. That is, uh, you are allowed to send uh, different signals to different bidders. And uh, uh, moreover, these signals are actually allowed to be correlated so that it can in, uh, induce the desired uh, collective behaviors. Uh, so these are kind of two basic classes of uh, signaling scheme when you have multiple, thi uh, multiple people to persuade. And next, I'm going to give, give you an example which illustrates public and private schemes in, uh, in, in auctions and also illustrates the intricacies in this uh, problem. So the example is a single item second prize auction with three bidders. This kind of the sim probably simply possible auction. And I'm, I guess most of you know this single item second prize auction. And now uh, the item going to have two types. I uh, have two states. For state one, uh, bidder one, bidders have this uh, value. For state two, bidder has another value profile. You could imagine this state could be, uh, for example, in other auction, the, uh, the user is a female or is a male, right? It's a kind of binary state. And uh, I'm going to, uh, the first state happens with probability 1 minus epsilon, and the second is with probability epsilon. So a, a kind of interesting uh, remark about this example is that this bitter 1 here uh, is kind of stronger than bitter 2 in the following sense. His value is larger than bitter 2 at the both states. So this 2 epsilon, this is epsilon. This is 1, this is 1 minus epsilon. So I'm going to say that bitter 1 is kind of stronger than bitter 2 because it has higher, I mean, higher value than bitter 2. Okay. Uh, a simple observation is that in public schemes, uh, bidding the expected true value is a dominant strategy for each bidder. Uh, this is kind of very follow some standard argument, which I'm not going to show here. Uh, therefore, in public scheme, scheme is very typical to adopt the dominant strategy equilibrium because uh, this is kind of the natural solution concept uh, people are going to use. Uh, the, uh, another claim I have is that uh, the revenue of the optimal public scheme for this problem is at most the three epsilon. Okay, why this? Well, as I said, bitter one is a stronger bitter is, the, is stronger than bitter two. So in any public scheme uh, and in any signal, bitter one gonna bid higher than bitter two, right? Because as I said, it's bidding their expected true value. So bitter one will always bid high bid higher than bitter two, right? In other words. Bitter one will either be uh, will either be ranked the first rank or the second rank, uh, be because he never be the third rank. So the the revenue record that the revenue is basically the uh, the bid of the second bidder. So the total revenue cannot be larger than the expected uh, value of bitter one, which is exactly three uh, kind of slightly less than three epsilon actually. So any optimal public scheme has revenue at most three epsilon in this example. Uh, so that's for public uh, scheme. Next, uh, we're going to look at some uh, private signaling scheme here. The, the particular private scheme I'm going to consider is the follows. I'm going to reveal four information to bidder 2 and 3 and no information to bidder 1. So bidder 1 cannot distinguish between these two states, but bidder 2 and bidder 3 can. OK? Uh, it turns out that this example actually illustrates several very interesting messages. Uh, the first message is that uh, I claim truthful bidding is not equilibrium in this case, in, uh, in this private scheme. Okay? In particular, for bidder 2 and 3, because they know exactly the state, it's very easy to see that bidding their true value is a dominant strategy for them, which is good, okay? It's a dominant strategy. But I claim that for bidder 1, he will not be willing to bid her expected value, which is roughly 3 epsilon here, because the expected value is 3 epsilon. He will not bid in 3 epsilon. Why? Well, if he bid 3 epsilon, what's, what's his utility? Well, he's going to lose at the first state because bid 3 is going to bid 1. And he will lose at the second state as well because bid 2 is going to bid 1 minus epsilon. So this guy is going to get, uh, bid 1 will get utility 0. And it turns out that his equilibrium bid is any value between 1 minus epsilon to 1. Why this is, a uh, why this is a better? Well, if we bid something between 1 minus epsilon to 1, 
he's going to lose here because beta 3 is going to be the 1. He's going to lose here. But he's going to win here because this guy is going to be the 1 minus epsilon. He gonna, uh, his value is 1, and he's going to beat something between. And he will win this auction and get some, uh, receive some positive utility. OK? And, uh, and actually, any bid here is an equilibrium for him. So you can see that there are infinitely many equilibrium. And it's not clear at all which one you should adopt. Uh, so but, so this, this shows that the truthful bidding is not equilibrium. And the second message it conveys that there's actually a, a large revenue gap between public and private scheme. Uh, in particular, I have shown you that the revenue optimal public signaling is at, least at the most 3 epsilon. And the revenue of this private scheme it turns out to be at least 1 minus epsilon, even for the worst equilibrium. Because in the, because in the equilibrium, beta 1 is going to bid something, between, something larger than 1 minus epsilon. And uh, in that case, the revenue here is at least 1 minus epsilon, and the revenue here is at least 1 minus epsilon. So their total revenue is at least 1 minus epsilon. Right, so there's a big gap between uh, private, uh, uh, the big gap, a uh, revenue gap between public and private uh, scheme. And the third message is that uh, this private scheme actually extracts almost a full surplus from this, uh, from this auction. Because uh, its revenue is at least 1 minus epsilon, and uh, the total social surplus is 1. Because in this case, this guy has the highest value, this guy has the highest value. So the surplus is 1. And uh, it turns out that there's actually a more general conclusion about this, where show that how private scheme can extract almost a full surplus uh, in, in, a, in a particular setting uh, uh, from this paper. Uh, so this example kind of illustrates some intricacies uh, in this public and private scheme in auctions. And there were actually many uh, other works were about uh, persuasion in auctions. Uh, for example, in the one bidder, if you only have one bidder or, or one buyer case, uh, in this case, there were, there were previous work which characterized all the possible revenue and welfare trade-offs uh, uh, of persuasion in this setting. Though there, they have a different name, which they call uh, price discrimination. I think Shen uh, here is one of the author here. <coughs> and uh, there are also many work about multiple, uh, the case with multiple bidders in the auctions. So uh, Fu et al. characterized the, uh, r show that revealing for information is the optimal public scheme in Myerson's optimal auction. So if you run Myerson's optimal auction and you are only allowed to uh, send a public scheme, their revealing for information is optimal. And there were some work studies how to compute the optimal public scheme in second prize auctions, which is, uh, which is a different auction format. And there were also work study, uh, what if you, are, you have some constraint, you, you have constraint on your signaling scheme, and how to compute the optimal scheme. And uh, there were also work studies, both uh, public and private schemes in second prize auctions, and so on. <coughs> So that's the application part. So I'm kind of close to the conclusion. So finally, I'm going to show, uh, I will illustrate that how persuasion actually sits within a much broader picture called uh, information structure and uh, highlights the future direction there. So the more general question is called the information structure design, uh, which studies how to influence the equilibria of a, ga of a Bayesian game by designing who knows what, so basically by designing how much each player knows in the game. And there were different ways to kind of characterize, to cat categorize uh, problems within, uh, within this uh, frame. But my favorite way is kind of to divide it into according to the number of receivers you have and whether the receivers has private information or not. Okay, so there were two dimensions. Uh, the, most basic, uh, the most basic problem is the Bayesian persuasion problem which is, uh, has one receiver, and the receiver do not have private information. Uh, this is also the main focus of this, uh, of this uh, tutorial, uh, uh, the part of this tutorial, and uh, except for the auction part, there were multiple uh, receivers in that case. And uh, so that's for uh, Bayesian persuasion. And there were also many work about uh, multiple receivers. So uh, for example, for the basic models, there were, there were some study about basic models in this space. For example, there was a study about you want to persuade two receivers who are playing a zero-sum game. 
So this is kind of a very basic problem. And uh, there were also work study how to persuade uh, two receivers in a general sum game, but uh, there were only two states and uh, two actions. Okay, so uh, there were also work study how do you persuade uh, multiple receivers, but uh, they have no externalities. That is, the, the, the receiver do not affect each other directly. Uh, and so, and uh, every receiver has a binary action. So this is, again, a kind of very special and a very basic setting for this, uh, for this problem. And so that's for the basic models. And uh, there were also, there were a lot of applications about this case. For example, there was study about how do you persuade uh, voters, which are multiple receivers. And how do you persuade uh, drivers in a routing game? And uh, how do you kind of persuade uh, customers in a recommendation system by strategically reveal information to the customers? And uh, how do you kind of persuade uh, uh, strategic customers in the queuing, queuing system by uh, strategically revealing the waiting time uh, to the customers. So these are kind of just some applications. There are actually other, other more applications as well. So that's about uh, persuading uh, multiple receivers. But in both of these cases, their players do not have private information. And there were also kind of study about the case where the, uh, the receiver might have private information about the states of nature. So in other words, both the sender has information about the states and the, pri the receiver also have information about the states. And in this case, the problem is uh, usually more intricate and is uh, very relevant to mechanism design. Uh, in particular, uh, much of, so there were some study, study about, there was some study about how to elicitate the receiver's private information when you're designing the signaling scheme. Uh, for example, uh, this uh, econ paper study is a basic model and it relates it to the structure of mechanism design. And uh, there were also work studies uh, persuasion in the Bayesian Stackerberger game where, how, where you want to elicit the followers type uh, when you design a signaling scheme. Uh, so, but, in this, but, but in general, this space actually have uh, limited work. There were not much work on this space yet. And for this even harder space, uh, very, very, very little has been explored. So much, most of the problem here are open and hasn't been e explored much. And uh, uh, if you want, so actually you can see this paper for a unified perspective about all these problems. And uh, it's very, they give a very nice kind of overall example uh, about how to, uh, example about how all these problems can, uh, can be uh, studied in a unified example. And uh, so as uh, uh, Richard mentioned that, uh, there are also work about uh, where you, ha you might have multiple senders. They're gonna, each sender will send the, will persuade the receiver, and then there were competition among senders. Um, so, but that's kind of in another space of this uh, line. And I guess uh, that's kind of the high level structure, uh, high level picture of this whole uh, literature. And finally, I would like to highlight a few future directions. So the first is, uh, about information structure design with the multiple receivers. So, uh, so there were some basic questions like how do you persuade a multiple receiver with externalities? For example, they're gonna affect each other and you might, they're gonna play some equilibrium. And uh, with the private information, the, the receiver gonna hold private information about the states and uh, may, the receiver may have multiple actions. Currently, this, uh, the, there were some basic model that focus on kind of very simple and very basic uh, questions uh, so far. And also it's interesting to look at the case where you want to kind of dynamically or repeatedly persuade the receiver. So there were multiple rounds. You want to reveal information kind of sequentially. So there hasn't been much study about this. I think even in econ literature, there hasn't been much study about this. And also you might want to consider constraints or cost for the signaling scheme. For example, uh, it's kind of costly to send some signal and or maybe you, you are constrained, you, know, you cannot send many signals, or maybe you cannot, uh, you have a differential privacy constraint. You, for, uh, sorry, for, uh, for example, you have privacy constraint, right? You cannot reveal too much information about the state due to some privacy concerns. And how do you study signaling scheme under these constraints? And finally, how do you, uh, how do you apply this in kind of concrete applications? So that's kind of the first part of the kind of future directions. The, so, so far I have talked about how to kind of uh, use information to influence the equilibria. This is actually tied up with another question, that is 
how do we value and pricing, uh, how price information. And uh, in this case, especially when you use information to kind of uh, influence the equilibrium with the multiple people, so it's kind of, the, it's not clear that how to value and price information. So Bo in the second part talking about how do you value information for a single agent. But now the problem becomes much more complicated. You have a kind of a group, of you, the, so the information is revealed to multiple agents. And how do you value them? How do you value the information? And how do you probably maybe uh, in some setting you want to kind of price, uh, price the value of information as well. So this, uh, as I said, this connects to the first part and the second part of this tutorial. And uh, another question is that so far I have talked about how do you use information to influence the equilibrium. But there's a kind of pre-step, that is how do you ob obtain this information. Usually the information is obtained through data. So you might want to take this uh, pre-step into account and look at how do you uh, utilize data to uh, generate information and then influence the equilibrium. Or more generally or more broadly, how do you kind of utilize data to uh, improve the decision making by influence, uh, influence players' behavior? And, uh, and finally, the relation between persuasion and information elicitation. This is particularly important when the uh, receivers have private information. So you want to uh, reveal information and then uh, elicit, also elicit that information from the receivers. Uh, I guess that's it. Thank you. Questions? <coughs> Yes. So this is more, more of a high level question about the model. So uh, in the solution model, we are assuming that uh, the receiver is uh, essentially uh, risk neutral in the sense that it's yeah. maximizing the expected uh, expected uh, <coughs> Yeah, that's right, that's right. Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. So uh, I'm not, uh, so basically I think that I, I don't know much work about that. So personally, I thought about this problem a little bit, but uh, I didn't go through that path just because there were kind of many questions along the line. So I think currently this whole domain is kind of, sorry, this kind of the whole literature is kind of, is kind of just uh, at the preliminary stage, I, I would say. So there were m really many questions you could consider, and the risk neutral, risk averse, or risk seeking is uh, also a very interesting question to study. I know in auction there was study about what if the bidders are risk averse or risk uh, neutral or things, and in this literature I'm not aware of much work on this. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Sure. Uh, any other questions? Yes. It's a question about kind of things from an applied perspective. Yeah. Um, you know, in the modeling. Or there are a bunch of assumptions that are made about, you know, the, the, the priors on behalf of the, you know, the people that you're signaling to and their knowledge of the likelihood and all of that. Yeah. Um, and of course, when you, you know, do things, you have to make modeling assumptions. But I wonder, kind of like just empirically, how how robust are these kinds of models, and, and what kinds of approaches have people considered for? Addressing challenges that arise when, when you know, when these, when particular aspects of uh, those modeling assumptions cause problems. Uh, so, when we say assumptions, what what specifically you mean? Like, well, there is example, a in the coaching application, yeah, right. Uh, you the, the the modeling approach assumes that the poachers know the likelihood of um, of a signal in different states of the world. Yeah. And also, you know, we assume that we that uh, poachers have a particular prior distribution over whether or not their arrangers are close. Yeah, that's right. And we assume that we know what those are and assume it's homogenous across the poachers. Yeah. And, you know, of course those assumptions are not totally true. Um, they might be close to being true or they might be totally wrong. Yeah. And I imagine when you deploy this in the field, some of the time it works great and then other times it like just falls apart. Yeah, that's right. That's and right. so I'm just wondering about kind of the state of that. 
so to answer your question, uh, I, I, I don't think there's uh, much study about this. Uh, so I, actually, for the portrait setting, actually, I personally consider a little bit about this. And I would be happy to talk to, with you more uh, offline. So I was thinking about this, like, what if uh, the prior kind of, the prior, for example, the, uh, uh, the poachers believe about the poaching probability is slightly different from the, uh, from the real probability. And so how would this affect the equilibrium? I, would, I thought about uh, this and currently trying to work on this. But I think if you, if you ask about the general literature, whether there's any work, uh, published work about this, I'm not aware of any, yeah. So a lot of things to study in the space, yeah. <coughs> yes. Uh, pardon me, could you repeat the uh, question? Okay. So, in terms of priors, the, priors, yeah. Uh, the research has some priors on other states of the world, right? Yeah, that's so, true. I'm just wondering if there are some regions of priors that there is no way for the signal to, to design or signal schemes to, to prescribe the agents. If there is uh, any. Uh, which of the priors? Oh, you mean if there is some prior that uh, I cannot design a signaling yes. scheme? Uh, well, no, because you can always design a trivial signaling scheme that is revealed for information, right? So for every prior, you can design some signaling schemes. It's just uh, how large is the possible s scheme you can induce, right? For some prior. Yeah, yeah, so for example, one example is uh, the prior is, uh, is just a, is a single, is, is, a, is a deterministic state, right? Is you, you only have, uh, the prior is a probability, with probability one, the, st the student is excellent, let's say. Right, in this case, signaling doesn't help because, uh, you know, with probability one, the student is excellent, just means every student is excellent. You, you cannot increase your utility anymore, right? Uh, Right, so you have to um, have some, you have to have some kind of space that uh, you can, you can kind of relax, it, not relax, you kind of decompose the prior. Another prior is that the student is always average. In this case, you cannot design any scheme to increase your utility, you're always zero, right? Everyone knows the student is, uh, if the student is always average, you cannot increase your utility. So you have to have some space that you can decompose it, yeah. Uh, any other questions? <coughs> okay, uh, good. I think we're kind of roughly on time. Yeah, so uh, lunch, I guess, is starting in five minutes. I guess upstairs a level in what's called the carrier volume, but they told us there'll be signs. They also said uh, look out for reserved tables and don't sit in those.